We're live. Thank you. Just confirming the live stream. Good morning, and at this time, will sergeants please start their recordings? Computer recording rolling. Thank you. Cloud recording rolling. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Thank you, and good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Education. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair Traeger. We are ready to begin. Good morning and welcome to today's virtual education committee hearing on the Department of Education's academic recovery plan and introduction number 2374, a local law to amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to classroom capacity. I am Mark Traeger, chair of the education committee. Earlier this year, on January 20th, this committee held a hearing on COVID-19's impact on student learning. We heard and learned about the myriad of challenges posed <clears throat> by COVID-19 and the introduction of remote learning into the school system um, and the adverse impact on student learning and academic achievement uh, that continues to this day and will for, continue for, for years to come. We learned of the COVID-19 slide in which students showed patterns of academic setbacks throughout an extended uh, closure of typical summers and so-called summer slide with steeper declines in mathematics uh, than in reading. For example, uh, the Northwest Evaluation Association, or NWEA, uh, projected that students started the 2020-2021 school year with roughly 70% of the learning gains in reading relative to a typical school year, uh, but just 50% of the typical learning gains in math. Uh, the inequitable rollout of remote learning Again, I'm going to repeat the inequitable rollout of remote learning led to attendance loss and, 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 and number of, of kids disconnecting, uh, no fault of their own, especially among vulnerable student populations, created technical issues for parents and left some teachers underprepared for remote instruction. New York City public schools are now back to full time in person instruction for all students, but simply because uh, many have returned to the classroom does not mean that all is well. The pandemic uh, widened uh, pre-existing uh, opportunity gaps, hitting historically disadvantaged students hardest. A McKinsey and Company research report on the lingering effects of what they called unfinished learning found that at the end of the 2020-2021 school year, using math proficiency as a measurement, students in majority of black schools ended the year with six months of unfinished learning, students in low income schools with seven. High schoolers have become more likely uh, to drop out of school and high school seniors, especially those from low income families, are less likely to go on to post-secondary education. This does not even account for multilingual learners, students in temporary housing, and students with disabilities. I also want to say that there's really also been no real accounting of the number of students particularly high schools who have taken on greater responsibilities because of the pandemic. Uh, whether their mom or dad or parents lost their jobs, facing hard time. So many high school kids I've heard have, have begun entering the workforce uh, to help mom and dad afford to pay rent. There's never been a full accounting of that. That also needs to be, to be factored in. The numbers and statistics are sobering. While some of our public school students have made gains on academic learn learning uh, uh, impacts for which they've suffered, far too many have not, and, and the gap continues to widen. On Thursday, uh, July 8th, 2021, Mayor de Blasio announced a new initiative, the New York City Universal Academic Recovery Plan, backed by $635 million. This new recovery plan is focused on six areas, early literacy, developing students as digital citizens, preparing students for college and careers, 
investing in special education services, building a universal curriculum across all city schools, and expanded uh, social and emotional learning uh, support. While I applaud these efforts, as many seem to be addressed at tackling longstanding equity issues, they don't target all aspects of academic recovery, and that is troubling. One notable absence uh, is a focus on math. Study after study has shown that declines in student achievement in math are larger than those in reading. As a gateway subject, a subject that typically provides foundational skill and knowledge for success in STEM fields and other subjects, math should also be a priority for the DOE. While I appreciate the academic recovery plan, I simply believe it is not comprehensive enough to address some of the larger issues at hand. The solutions needed must be bigger, bolder, smarter, and leveraging everything we are able to. Throughout this pandemic, I have acknowledged the Herculean efforts made by this department in its response to an unprecedented crisis. We have worked together, and I have also held the department accountable through oversight function. I have and will continue to applaud the efforts of the academic teams on how they've listened to, to this body and accepted some of the recommendations or policy areas we, we have come up with. But I fear that this plan is inadequate. Uh, I also fear that we are uh, in the city of New York not really taking into account how significant some of the staffing challenges we have in our school system. You need staff to implement this work. And to this day, I continue to hear of staffing issues plaguing our schools, particularly support staff, power professionals. We have children with IEPs who are now weeks without a mandated power professional. I keep hearing about the thousands of subs available, but subs have the right not to come in. They have a right to choose where they want to work. And I continue to hear that in many cases, uh, services are not being provided. And that's impacting this academic recovery uh, program because you need to pay people, you need to hire people for after school program or Saturday program. And I continue to hear that they're having great difficulty getting staff to work, uh, which really will undermine the whole purpose and premise of this academic recovery uh, vision. Uh, during the hearing, I need to hear more details from the department. I need to hear more about the academic recovery and the methods that are being used to assess individual student academic impacts, as well as interventions like tutoring. Uh, I wanna hear concrete actions being taken uh, to address unfinished learning and, 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 and the staffing issues plaguing our public school system. Finally, today we'll hear intro 2374, which is a bill which would require each classroom in, in, in a school of the city of, a school district of the city of New York, which includes districts one to 32, district 75 and district 79 schools to provide 35 square feet of net floor area per child by September, 2024 with no less than one third of schools complying with such targets by September, 2022, and no less than two thirds of schools complying with such targets by September, 2023. Efforts to reduce class size in New York City public schools have not gotten very far to date, despite all the passion and hard work of parents and advocates and teachers and students, including all of you here today. Once again, the benefits of class size reduction are clear. Uh, better school performance and, and better life outcomes. We hope to hear from DOE today what, if anything, they are currently doing to reduce class sizes for our needier students and what plans, if any, they have going forward, especially in light of this legislation. And also just note for the record that the last time we as a city looked at the building code for occupancy in schools was in the 1930s when tuberculosis was the big issue, the big public health issue during that time. The world has changed greatly since the 1930s. And, you know, we are now dealing with a, 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 a significant uh, a pandemic. Um, and we need to update our building code and update our city codes to meet the reality of, of, of our time. I want to thank everyone who is testifying today. I want to thank the city council staff and my staff for all the work they put into today's hearing, Malcolm Butterhorn, Jen Atwell, Kalima Johnson, Chelsea Batemore, Macy Sarkissian, and Frank Perez, and my chief of staff, Anna Scape, my policy director, Vanessa Ogle, and director of communications, Maria Henderson. I will now turn things over to moderator, Malcolm Butterhorn.
Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Malcolm Budahorn, Counsel to the Education Committee. Before we begin testimony, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by a member of our staff, and Zoom will prompt you to accept the unmute. I will be calling on public witnesses to testify in panels after the conclusion of the administration's testimony and council member questions, so please listen for your name to be called. Council members who have questions should use the raise hand function in Zoom. You will be called on in the order with which you raised your hand after the full panel has completed testimony. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. Please note for the purposes of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. For public panelists, after you are unmuted, please listen for the sergeant at arms to give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. All public testimony will be limited to two minutes. Please do not read your testimony verbatim. All written testimony will be read by committee members and committee staff, so please be sure to email it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Testimony will be accepted for 72 hours following the close of this hearing. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Dr. Linda Chen, Chief Academic Officer. LaShawn Robinson, Deputy Chancellor for School Climate and Wellness. Adrian Austin, Deputy Chancellor of Community Empowerment, Partnerships and Communications. Lawrence Pendergast, Deputy Chief Academic Officer for Teaching and Learning. Christina Fodi, Deputy Chief Academic Officer of Special Education. Maritza Sanchez Medina, Deputy Chief Academic Officer of Multilingual Learners. Thomas Tarako, Chief Executive of Space Management. Rebecca Rawlins, Chief Executive of the Office of District Planning. Andrea Bender, Chief of Staff at New York City's uh, School Construction Authority. Maria Begg Robertson. Andrew Fletcher, Senior Executive Director of Early Literacy. Kenyatta Reed, Executive Director, Office of Safety and Youth Development. Sarah Jonas, Executive Director, Office of Community Schools. And Flavia Puello Perdomo, Chief Executive, Division of School Climate and Wellness. I will first uh, read the oath, and after, I will call on each of you from the administration to uh, individually respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee? and to respond honestly to council member questions. Dr. Chen? Yes, I do. DC Robinson? Yes, I do. DC Austin? Yes, I do. Lawrence Pendergast? <laughs> Lawrence, you're unmuted. Okay, we can come back to you if you do answer any questions for the record. Christina Foti. Uh, we can come back to her if she's answering any questions. Uh, Mirza Sanchez Medina. Yes, I do. Uh, Thomas Tracco. Yes, I do. Andrea Bender. Yes, I do. Maria Begg Robertson. Yes, I do. Thank you. Andrew, uh, Andrew Fletcher. Back to him. Kenyatta Reed. <clears throat> Sarah Jonas. Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, Flavia Puello Perdomo. Yes, I do. Thank you. And I'm just going to quickly, while we're, before we start, just quickly come back oh. to folks that I missed, maybe they're at the computer. Um, if we can unmute Lawrence Pendergast. Lawrence, uh, if you're speaking to the computer, we can't hear you and you're unmuted. Just FYI. Um, okay, while well, he's figuring that out, we go back to Christina Foti. Yes, I do. 
Ja. Okay, she's not there. Andrew Fletcher. Oh, I just, I oh. think it just worked. <laughs> I do. Yes, I do. Perfect. There we go. Um, I'm just going to get these issues out now. Uh, if we can go back to Andrew Fletcher, please, and unmute him. Yeah. Yes, I do. Thank you. And Kenyatte Reed, you're still unmuted. Are you there? Yes, I do. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chen, whenever you're ready to begin. OE. I want to express my deep gratitude to our teachers, staff, and school leaders who have shown up each day to serve our students and who are getting to know our students better and better each day to draw out their brilliance and cultivate their growth. I also want to really thank our families for partnering with us closely in this endeavor. Good morning, Chair Traeger and all the members of the Education Committee here today. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of all my colleagues regarding the Department of Education's Academic Recovery Plan. I am Dr. Linda Chen, Chief Academic Officer at the DOE, and I am joined here today by Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson, Deputy Chancellor Adrian Austin, Andrea Bender, Chief of Staff for the School of Construction Authority, Lawrence Pendergast, Deputy Chief Academic Officer for Teaching and Learning, Christina Fodi, Deputy Chief Academic Officer for Special Education, Mirza Sanchez Medina, Deputy Chief Academic Officer for Multilingual Learners, and other senior leaders from the DOE. Over the past month, we have all had the privilege of witnessing students, families, and our invaluable staff joyfully reconnecting with each other. Our students have been through so much throughout this pandemic and need the support of their school communities now more than ever. The evidence continues to be clear that teaching and learning face-to-face -face in the classroom is the absolute best way for our students to grow academically, socially, and emotionally. We are thrilled to have them back in person. We are not simply returning to the way things were before the pandemic we are making historic investments to jumpstart academic achievement for every student across our system. And I want to say a huge thank you to this council for all of your advocacy that have helped to make a lot of this possible. Our students lost so much during the traumatic past year and a half. It is absolutely critical that we support them academically, socially, and emotionally by knowing where each student is in each of these areas and leveraging that information to cultivate welcoming and affirming learning environments where we hold high expectations and provide rigorous instruction for every student, particularly those most impacted by the pandemic. The work began over the summer with Summer Rising, our bridge to this school year. We witnessed firsthand at sites across the city what it meant for parents, students, and educators to have an academically enriching and fun experience over the summer. Our students got back into gear in their learning process so they could hit the ground running when they returned this September. Now that all students are back in person, the strategic framework for our academic recovery plan guides school communities and support for students for this school year and beyond. That plan emphasizes critical areas of focus, including investing in social emotional supports for every student, early learning for all, digital literacy, college and career readiness, special education services, supports for multilingual and immigrant learners, and a rigorous and inclusive universal curriculum. We know that children in every community are carrying trauma caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. So successful academic recovery that enables students to learn to their potential can only happen when their emotional and mental health needs are addressed. Our schools need to be places of healing so we are making major investments in social emotional supports for students. As every seasoned educator understands from experience, teachers and schools need to know their, their students well. To facilitate that process across the system, we have started implementing our social emotional screening tool, which will reach all students by the end of November. Our goal is to pinpoint areas of strength in key social emotional learning competencies 
and to help identify students in need so they can be quickly matched with appropriate services. Our K-8 schools have begun screening students this week and high school will begin next week. All 3K and pre-K students will be screened by December. In addition, to guarantee that every school has the resources to support students who may be in crisis, we announced that we would hire over 500 social workers and mental health support staff. To date, the vast majority of those social workers have been hired, 93%. And we are working with each school community to eliminate any barriers in hiring for any outstanding positions. Finally, and thanks in part to support from this council, we are adding over 130 new community schools to provide expanded social, emotional, academic, and extracurricular services to students in the highest need communities. Relatedly, all schools have selected low stakes academic screening tools in reading and math that are currently identifying where students are academically. This is the first of three periods when screeners will be administered this year so that our teachers can use the data to inform core instruction and identify where supports and interventions are needed. Screening tools are also part of our continued commitment to early literacy and our early literacy for all efforts. This component of the academic recovery plan has the singular goal of enabling all students to read at grade level by the end of second grade. In addition to the screeners, we are increasing the number of universal literacy reading coaches to approximately 500 in order to provide all K-2 classrooms with support from a literacy coach. In addition, we are training our K-2 educators to provide focused literacy support to students in need. On September 3rd, we released an academic recovery school allocation of $350 million. With this funding, schools will receive funding for professional learning, strengthening core instruction, enrichment, and planning for targeted interventions. Schools will also use 20% of this funding to support arts programming. The pandemic reinforced our recognition that our students need to be digital citizens to thrive. After we were forced to close our buildings in March of 2020, we undertook an unprecedented investment in technology with over 800,000 devices purchased by the DOE and schools. The academic recovery plan builds on this technological advancement by guaranteeing that all K-12 public school students have access to a digital device and ensuring all students become fully fluent digital citizens. We are distributing more than 175,000 devices as needed, expanding access to computer science for all to 400,000 students by 2024, and training over 5,000 educators in advanced computer science. Technological skills and digital literacy are simply vital for all our students and their futures. Preparing our students for the future also means setting them up to be college and career ready. And the academic recovery plan helps ensure that every student is best prepared for that next step in life. So we are planning for free after school personalized college counseling for every junior and senior. And we are working to offer universal college financial aid guidance to help students and families navigate the application process. We've also added 41 remote AP advanced language or elective courses, and we will be adding more in the coming semester. These courses are taught synchronously by tenured DOE educators and made available to any school that cannot other off otherwise offer these classes. In addition, we are restoring college now to serve 22,000 students from all high schools while investing in student success centers for 34 high schools to ensure post graduation plans for all students. Finally, we will build on the capabilities of the New York City Schools account to ensure that every family can track their child's progress through post-secondary planning milestones. We know that this pandemic hit our most vulnerable students the hardest, which is why our recovery plan includes significant investments to special education, including direct services, family communication, and preparing teachers to provide targeted post-pandemic supports. From the youngest learners to those preparing for graduation, students with individualized education programs will receive unprecedented assistance. 
they will also participate with other students in both academic and social emotional learning screeners so teachers can better understand their needs. In addition, all students with IEPs will be offered additional instruction and related services along with the IEP recommended programs and services they receive during the school day. We are also providing eligible students age 21 and older with continued instruction towards receiving their diploma or other exit credential or to receive consultation to facilitate post-secondary plans for college and career readiness. Because families are critical to this work, we are expanding family workshops and information sessions available through our Beyond Access series, which was launched during the pandemic and supports families of students with disabilities. This year's sessions began on October 5th and will be held every Tuesday evening from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. For our youngest learners with disabilities, we are adding 800 seats for students with disabilities in preschool by next fall, 2022. And we are expanding committees on preschool special education to expedite evaluations and IEP meetings so that students can get services they urgently need. Each focus area of the recovery plan also includes dedicated investments for multilingual learners and immigrant students to address their distinctive needs in making academic progress and learning languages. Particularly in the context of returning to full-time in-person learning, these efforts include conducting wellness checks and providing social emotional learning support to identify the needs of multilingual learners. We are training English as a new language, bilingual, and content area teachers to track student progress and provide targeted support specifically for multilingual learners. And we have provided schools with dedicated funding to purchase texts in home languages and build home language libraries. In addition, we are expanding the Immigrant Ambassador Program across 30 high schools that match immigrant DOE students with college students to foster mentorship and early college awareness. We have also designed the Post-Secondary Readiness for ELLs program, or PREP, to build the capacity of school-based teams to offer students ongoing workshops that afford them an opportunity to, to explore, prepare, and apply to a post-secondary pathway of their choosing. Our Dream Squad program organizes school-based teams of educators committed to creating, implementing, and sustaining a safe and welcoming environment for multilingual learners, immigrant youth, and undocumented students. We are currently in the process of selecting schools for all three immigrant ambassador prep and Dream Squad programs. We know that families are essential partners in any successful recovery plan for our students. So we launched a five borough family engagement tour. School communities shared their experiences over the school year, DOE leadership answered their questions and we gathered all this feedback to strengthen our plans. We also continue to build in our innovative parent university that has hosted over 600 courses for over 125,000 users. We are currently developing a series called DOE 101, which will provide short videos to help families navigate the DOE, and we are expanding our home language offerings, thanks in part to funding from this council. Finally, recognizing the diversity of our students and school communities, New York City will develop a rigorous, inclusive, and affirming curriculum by fall 2023 that we're calling the Universal Mosaic Curriculum. Currently, there's no single off-the-shelf curriculum academically rigorous and inclusive enough for New York City's 1,600 schools and 1 million students. This curriculum will be built for, on liter literacy for all, accelerate student learning, and free teachers from time-consuming curriculum development. This work is beginning soon with engagement sessions taking place with communities, families, and educators. And thanks to a historic and historic and significant investment by this council, we are also looking forward to the development of a Black Studies curriculum with partners from across the city. We are kickstarting these efforts by providing an unprecedented infusion of books into every classroom for the school year that reflect a variety of histor histories, languages, and experiences that make up the city. 
Schools received introduction materials and digital libraries and will receive the rest of the collection next week. This comprehensive, culturally responsive curriculum is a groundbreaking investment that will be a resource for our students and teachers and an enormous source of strength for our system as a whole. Next, I'll provide some remarks on, our, on the proposed legislation. Intro uh, 2374 would require that each classroom in New York City public school provide 35 square feet of net floor area per child by 20, September 2024. Let me start by saying the DOE and this administration have made a clear and strong investment to ensuring the health and safety of our students. Our CDC aligned multi-layered approach throughout the pandemic has made us a national leader in keeping our students safe. Simply put, Intro 2374 is impractical and the administration strongly opposes this measure. The proposed legislation would create a seat deficit at every grade level, require the building of hundreds of thousands of new seats across the city and be incredibly disruptive to the school system as a whole. Under this administration, the School Construction Authority has created 51,540 new seats in fulfillment of the mayor's commitment to reduce overcrowding and increase diversity. In fact, this capital plan is the first to fully fund all of the identified seat needs, a $7.8 billion investment in this plan alone. We are currently in the process, uh, in process on 20,676 of the 57,000 seats funded in this program funded in this plan with another 5,500 seats in the pipeline. We are nearly halfway there as we approach the halfway mark of our plan. We anticipate in an estimated 93 buildings that will help us alleviate overcrowding and respond to ongoing pockets of growth in neighborhoods of existing or projected overcrowding. As has been noted, this legislation is anticipated to create an estimated additional seat need upwards of 200,000 without accounting for future growth. Our typical new elementary school is approximately 500 seats and typically takes about five years or longer to site, design, and construct. It can take even longer if the site is complicated or the school is not a simple design. With our current capital commitment, the largest in the SEA's history, it will take us a minimum of 15 years to build about 75,000 seats if sites are available. That means without factoring for any additional growth in student population, it would take several decades for SEA to construct enough seats to meet this need. Overall, it is not possible that SCA could build sufficient inventory in any reasonable time frame to address the seat need created by this legislation. We do not believe this legislation is warranted or practical. Let me conclude by returning to the academic recovery plan, which is a vision that demonstrates the DOE's commitment to lifting up New York City's school communities beginning this school year and ensuring that they have the resources to recover stronger than ever for years to come from the impacts of the pandemic. This fall, we have welcomed our students back to schools that are prepared to support them academically and socially and emotionally after all they have been through. That's what the Universal Academic Recovery Plan is all about. Thank you so much for your time, and we are now available to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chen. I just want to mention that uh, we've been joined. Uh, by Councilmember Lewis, Councilmember Dinowitz, Councilmember Riley, Councilmember Rose, Councilmember Borelli, Councilmember Brennan, Councilmember Feliz, Councilmember Grudenchik, Councilmember Kalos, Councilmember Ampre Samuel, Councilmember Lander, Councilmember uh, Gennaro, Councilmember Barron, and Councilmember Drum. Uh, and if there's anyone else, I guess Malcolm will uh, let, us, let us know. Uh, Dr. Chen, uh, I, 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 want to, I want to first get to the academic recovery piece here, but uh, couldn't help but hear some of the feedback you had about the uh, proposed intro. Um, you had mentioned, just, just so I'm clear, that DOE estimates that it would create a seat need of additional 200,000 seats. Is that, is that correct? Chair, um, I'd like to um, ask our Deputy uh, Chief Academic Officer, Larry Pendergast, to provide additional details on that legislation. 
Hi, Chair. Okay, yes, uh, look, we've taken a look at the legislation very closely. Uh, we um, appreciate its intent. Uh, however, uh, right now we do think it creates a huge seat need um, across the city in every district, in every borough, uh, without exception, and uh, will impact uh, every single school building we have. Uh, so uh, we do have colleagues from the School Construction Authority on, uh, the Office of District Planning, Space Planning, who are here we can speak more to it. Uh, but uh, the, the legislation as proposed really does present challenges in a, in a very short period of time. Okay, so what I just find interesting is that you're able to come to this hearing and give me an estimate of 200,000 uh, new seats that would be needed, but I am still not given the current enrollment number for the New York City public school system. Uh, could anyone give me an update today on how many kids are enrolled in our New York City public school system? Uh, Chair, we can give you that number very soon, as promised at the last hearing. We committed to sharing that data at the end of October. Uh, and we are going to honor that commitment. Uh, so very shortly, when schools have time to verify their, their registers, uh, and, and as you know, like that, that is a responsibility that does fall on teachers and principals, and we don't want to ask them to do it over and over again. Oh, Same. Mr. Prendergast, you're, you're speaking to a teacher. You're speaking to someone yes. who, who scanned, who gave the attendance sheets each day. They were scanned into ATS and... The DOE knows how many kids are in uh, the schools each day. Uh, they're just choosing not to share that information publicly. Oh, sir. For, for, yes, go sir, ahead. I know, I'm sorry, yes. I don't mean to interrupt you, but Jim, you also know sometimes you get the sheets back and they say, hey, Pendergast, you marked so-and-so present. Um, every other teacher marked them absent that day. Are you sure uh, that, that about this. So there's a verification process that goes on and it's the same time every year it is. So, uh, Mr. Pendergast, I, I would probably, I, I, it's, it's, it's hard for me, hard for me to, to accept that. Uh, so, but I, I share this because I find it fascinating how the DOE and SEA and folks can give me an estimate of additional seat need today, but still cannot provide us an update on uh, the, the total enrollment. Uh, I'm gonna get back to the bill because I have a lot more on that, but I, I want to get to the uh, academic uh, re recovery piece. Um, we fought very hard in this budget and with help from the federal government and, and, and from Albany, and of course uh, the city council uh, always prioritized fair student funding. And, uh, and this was, this was I, I thought, a, a very big accomplishment to get to every school to 100% at FSF. Um, I'm just curious to know if DOE has data today on how many new teachers have been hired so far in this school year as a result of the added money to fair student funding. So chair and members of the council, um, thank you for all of the support you have been advocating for, for years, quite frankly, around this foundational aid that does enable additional staff to be hired at the school level. I'm going to um, add, uh, ask Florence Pendergast to provide um, some details regarding staffing. Uh, good morning again. Uh, I don't have the exact number of new teachers that were hired with the funding, but uh, we can, uh, come back to you with estimates of those numbers. Uh, I would appreciate that data. And because and along those lines, I'm curious to know how many uh, new social workers have been hired with the money that we've also prioritized for hundreds of new social workers. Does anyone have data on that? We we also have the social worker data and we do have social workers in every school. Uh, and when we bring you the updated 
hiring data for the teachers will we'll get you the social worker data as well. Uh, Chair, if we could unmute DC Robinson, I just saw her wave, I think. Yes, I, absolutely. Hi, good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Uh, we're really um, grateful to council for the advocacy over the years to increase the number of social workers, school counselors, and other professionals in schools to support with mental health and wellness, especially in this moment. Um, the DOE, we were allocated a number of social workers this year, and we work collaboratively you know, across New York City with every single school of social work, um, advocates, school staff and others to ensure that we would be able to have mental health professionals available in school or in the community to be able to meet the needs of this moment. As we all know that our young people and our educators, we've all been impacted in tremendous ways over the last uh, year and a half and counting um, a little bit more at this point. Um, and having that resource on hand in schools um, has really been critical. Um, we do have that information available. We have about 93% of our social workers uh, staffed and hired, and the remaining uh, schools are still in process to, to get to 100%. But we started the school year strong um, and really ramped up to ensure that mental health supports were readily available. If someone can unmute Flavia Pueyo from my team, um, she has the data available for social workers and can share the numbers of um, current social workers and guidance counselors, psychologists, um, the new social workers, um, and other, others that we have supporting the work, almost 6,000 professionals at this point. Flavia? Good morning, Chair, and thank you, Deputy Chancellor Robinson. Um, so just to um, add to what Deputy Chancellor Robinson mentioned, we have, in fact, higher 93% 90, of the 500 social workers that were allocated. In addition to that, we know that the combined number of social workers and school counselor um, in our city is about 4,500. Uh, we currently have approximately 1,000 psychologists. We also um, know that we all got 30 new family supports. Um, so in total, we have around 6,000 employees that are dedicated to support um, the mental health wellness of our students, in addition to all of the different partnerships that Deputy Chancellor may, uh, mentioned, which include also our school-based mental health clinics and also- so, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Flavi, I'm sorry, you came in yeah. and out. What number did you uh, have for the number of total social workers working in our school system now? The number that I gave you was a combined number. So it's 4,500 combined social workers and school counselors. Um, as we know, that report um, we conduct yearly and it's publicly available. So we're gonna be releasing um, that report again um, during the spring uh, for ne of next year as we have. But currently uh, we know that we have 4,500 and we also know that out of the 500 additional that we receive funding, we actually are very proud of that because in September already we had 93% of, of those um, staff members that were selected by their principals and their remaining principals are working on closing out um, hiring and selection. So we thank you and council as always for that support. And so Fabia, so it, 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 just to be clear, um, there are still some schools that are still without a full-time social worker at this moment, or can you please clarify? Um, what I want to what I want to add um, as we clarify that that we know that um, the way that we look at mental health and wellness support in a school is a combination, right? So schools may rely on their social workers, schools may rely on their school counselors. Some schools have mental health clinics, and just uh, for context, mental health clinics um, on site may have a variety of mental health supports provider, which includes social worker, it can include psychologists, it may include psychiatrists or other, um, other providers. So when we're looking at um, the supports, we look at the plethora. So we may have a school that 
that for say may not have a school-based social worker that's covered by a clinic or that's covered by on some of the other supports that that I mentioned but we're happy to continue uh, working you know with that and provide any other additional data that you may require in this area and, and chair I just like to add that our all of our community schools have a mental health component um, that's included as part of the community school support and we also um, recently partnered with Health and Hospitals for a Pathways to Care program to strengthen community supports as well. So looking holistically at the supports that we have available across our school system and in communities to meet the needs of this moment. Um, and you know, we wouldn't be able to do that without the support of this council in particular, that you have all made historic investments in the mental health and well-being of our students. And uh, we greatly appreciate um, everything that you've done, um, including the recent investment in the mental health continuum that uh, we're partnering um, with others on to get that work implemented as well. And Deputy Chancellor, I, I do want to recognize uh, your, your leadership and work on that. And I know we're having a lot of conversations about safety uh, these days, but uh, those who work in the system, those who, who know know our children and, and, and love working with kids, know that safety is a very, it's a big term uh, because when you have kids coming into school hungry with insecure housing, that's also a safety issue. And when you have inadequate supports to support them, that's also a major safety issue. And so we absolutely value, respect, and appreciate the critical role that school safety agents play. And I, I, I wanna remind the public that the majority of this council actually supports keeping school safety agents and, and knowing the role they play in helping shape school safety climate. They can't do that work alone. Um, as we've pointed out before repeatedly in the past that we had more safety agents than social workers, counselors combined in the school system. And we continue to really need to do a lot more uh, to meet the social emotional needs of our kids, particularly in the moment that we're in. So I just wanna get that out in the record and I thank you Deputy Chancellor, for, for your work on that. Um, Mr. Prendergast, you, 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 to, to the list of data requests that I, I've, I've given you with regards to teachers, social workers, any information about power professionals? Because this is an issue that I continuously hear from schools to this very day, that there are many, many issues uh, in terms of staffing with powers. Can, can you speak to the number of new powers that have been hired in this school year? Yeah, uh, so first of all, returning to the previous question, Chair, uh, we, the team says that a little over 5,000 teachers were hired this year with, uh, and over 85% of the new fair student funding was spent on teacher salaries. Um, when it comes to paras, let me circle right back to you with the para number. And but, Mr. Prendergast, uh, just, just to unclear, you said 5,000 teachers. Are you including substitute teachers or are these are full-time positions in schools? Um, I, I believe those are full-time positions in schools, sir. Okay, and when you mentioned that the bulk of the FSF money was spent on teacher salary, uh, that also means new, that- Yeah. Uh, oh, is that a new, is that new teacher salary? Yes, no, I'm okay. sorry, the, the bulk of the, FS, the new FSF was spent on teacher salary. That was right. your question, original question. Right, because that also speaks to the fact that each year teacher contracts go up, the cost of, of retaining teachers goes up, and so uh, fair student funding goes to cover the cost of retaining veteran teachers in schools. Um, so that's uh, that's helpful to 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 know. Um, and you'll get us you'll get back to us on the number of power professionals. Is that right? Yes, sir. We'll circle right back. Okay. Can anyone uh, speak to me about how many currently to this moment in this day, how many uh, DOE central staffers are currently redeployed in schools? So chair, I can begin this. Um, we really appreciate everyone who's been all hands on deck. Um, the majority of our staff in the central and borough citywide offices are back at their jobs. Um, I believe, let me just get a number here. I just want to make sure we give you every day. It's been different based on the needs. Um, 
and I'll ask Lawrence, uh, Lawrence Pendergast as he's looking up the numbers for Paris to just provide also the numbers. 250. Sorry, I'm just looking. At the number currently, I believe, is 250 that are still redeployed, sir. And in which which positions are is are you finding the most hard to fill that you're forced to redeploy uh, central staff to schools? We have been um, paraprofessionals are one position as well as special education teachers. And that is uh, an area of great concern for us because the academic recovery program, particularly the after school and Saturday program, really is supposed to center uh, the student population that, as we all know, uh, many of students were not able to get their full set of required services during the last school year. And this was the big push to create a very big, bold vision program uh, to meet their needs. And uh, Dr. Chen, I have to tell you and others listening that not a day goes by that I don't hear from the school community, not just in my district, but across the five boroughs, I'm sure my colleagues hear similar stories, uh, where there are significant staffing issues in terms of particularly serving this vulnerable student population. Um, can you speak to where the academic prog uh, program is at in terms of staffing? And what is the plan? Is there a contingency plan in terms of addressing the shortage of staff uh, to meet the needs of the kids? Because I'll tell you, Dr. Chen, the purpose of this program was not to create a cookie cutter program just to kind of say every school has something. This is supposed to be tailored and customized to meet the individual learning needs of all of our kids as mandated by their IEP. So can you speak to where this is at and what is the plan uh, to address staffing issues? Chair, thank you for emphasizing the importance of a tailored plan and not a cookie cutter. Um, and you're, you're absolutely right about that. That is why the funding we distribute to schools is based on a recovery plan. Um, and that is happening right now with our special education students. I'm gonna ask that um, Deputy Chief Academic Officer, Christina Foti, provide more details about what's happening with that process around special education recovery services. Good morning, Chair, and good morning, members of the council. It's always nice to be with you. And Chair, um, I am overwhelmed by consistently by the passion with which you speak on behalf of our students with disabilities and grateful for that always. So thank you. Um, I wanna just quickly, if I can touch upon, upon the paraprofessional question and then we'll, we'll definitely dive right into uh, recovery services. But um, Chair, paraprofessionals play, as you know, really well, um, an incredibly important and vital role in our system. Um, and we are certainly working diligently to provide every child with an IEP uh, access to, to their paraprofessionals. I can say that there are 8,500 substitute paraprofessionals available in the pool right now, and over 3,000 new substitute paras have been added this school year alone. Um, our team has been able to, our, our DOE team, uh, our operations team has been able to expedite all processing of these subs while uh, still requiring a, a rigorous background check. Um, as an additional incentive, substitute paraprofessionals and teachers can earn uh, additional pay over the daily rate uh, for days worked before Thanksgiving um, as in hopes of, of, of getting as many qualified folks into the system as possible. Um, I also just wanna say in terms of the recovery services, uh, give you a quick update as to where we are. Um, in terms of occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, um, in uh, you're talking about the customization of this program. You're absolutely right. This is intended to provide additional related services um, and instructional services to our students with disabilities. On the related service front, um, I'm really delighted to say that we have, we are in the process of hiring over 400 OTPT and speech hires um, to help staff uh, our essential day-to-day -day needs, but also hopefully to play a very vital role in the delivery of recovery services in the upcoming school year. As we speak, individual recovery plans are being developed by um, our, our, our teachers and our schools. Um, funding was already allocated for the planning of the, of the delivery of recovery services and um, implementation funds will be arriving to schools shortly. We've been having weekly office hours with hundreds of principals to uh, help support them in 
the delivery and design of their recovery services um, and has been a real effort on our part to be as responsive and uh, nimble as possible to the concerns coming out of the field. Our, our, um, despite the many challenges our schools have faced over the past 19 months and continue to face, uh, this remains a, an enormous priority for our system, for our chancellor, for each of us on this call today. Um, and our, our method here is that we wanna reach as many students as quickly as possible, Chair. So, and I, I appreciate your service, uh, Ms. Foti. I just, um, when the DOE keeps listing the number of substitutes available, I just want to just, again, remind folks that substitutes don't have to come in and they can choose to, even if they do come in one day, they can choose to not come in the next day or they could request a transfer. And that is what I'm hearing is happening in our schools uh, literally every, every day. Do you have data on how many powers are, are currently placed on uh, unpaid leave as a result of not uh, complying with the vaccine mandate? I'm going to actually pivot over to Larry Pendergast. And if we don't have that exact number, Chair, we will make sure we provide that to you. Right. We will get that right away. So. Right. Because um, I think it's just important. And I think folks in DOE already know this, but I just want the public to understand that when we keep hearing these numbers of substitutes, it doesn't mean that they're coming in. Um, because we, we continue to hear there are some schools who are still short as many as 10 paraprofessionals, uh, which is a really serious issue, particularly for children with IEPs who are required to have these critical services. Um, I did not hear, uh, Ms. Hoti, forgive me if I missed this, what is the plan, the contingency plan, if we cannot adequately staff up? You, you mentioned the extra money available. Mm -hmm. uh, I am hearing that there is no big you know, rush of people looking to work after school or Saturdays. Um, so what is the plan to staff, to staff up these critical programs uh, if sure. there's no rush of staff? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, Pardon yeah, sure. Um, sure. Yes, Chair, I mean, we, this, as I mentioned, is, is an absolute priority for us. We, are, uh, we, we are, uh, have developed contingency plans around flexibilities for schools and uh, plan to release um, additional information on that topic shortly, Chair. We're not ready to, to do that today, but um, I can assure you that we are in the process of, uh, and have been at, of looking at um, alternatives and, and ways to support schools as they think, and, and help schools think flexibly about how to, how to deliver these services, recognizing that they are absolutely essential to our students this year. And Ms. Foti, is there a reason why that cannot be shared today? Chair, we are still uh, just finalizing. Okay. We've been getting a lot of feedback from various principals. Um, as you know, um, there are a number of factors that they're managing. And as uh, Deputy Chief Academic Officer Foti mentioned earlier, we've had a lot of office hours and we are now in the process of finalizing those flexibilities so that we can ensure consistency for everybody, including our families to know what those are. And I apologize, Dr. Chen, um, the, my mute button is, is really, <laughs> I'm having a hard time with it, Chair, and I apologize. I didn't mean to not respond to you. But um, as Dr. Chen said, we are in the process of, um, obviously, whatever flexibilities we put in place need to, uh, there are a number of stakeholders, Chair, that have to be on board with this in order to make this work properly. And so um, it's really, at this point, we need to, uh, we're in the process of getting to those all those stakeholders, and including our legal obligations, Chair, um, as well as our labor partners and everyone else to make sure that we're all on board with um, any modifications to the plan um, and want to do that in a um, responsible and communicative and partner and uh, uh, in a fashion that that is based on partnership. Um, so I apologize for not being able to offer more on that today, but um, I'm happy to provide additional updates to you chair and the council um, on this important topic. And, re and regarding the para non-vax question, 94% of all of our paraprofessionals are vaccinated. That's over 21,000 paraprofessionals have been vaccinated. 
uh, and it's approximately 1,500 have not been vaccinated. Okay. I, I'm just, you know, I, I'm concerned that we're just really not hearing uh, a, a contingency plan. And again, we're dealing with a population that has already have been, has been greatly impacted. And uh, it, it just seems that folks are just trying to kind of scramble because I know that as it is, schools are having a hard time staff up in the moment that we're in. And now a lot of money has been put in to uh, make up for a lot of uh, loss of services and impacts from the last school year. And there's a real serious concern that I have about we have this new money, but it's just, there's just a, there's a real concern about how it's going to be spent and how it's going to actually uh, meet the needs of the kids who really need the, 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 most, the most help. And let me ask you, uh, if Dr. Chen, anyone could speak to this. I know that uh, in our teaching preparatory institutions, we have a number of, we have a pipeline. We have students who are going, going through uh, the, the graduate school system who might have already taken some of the exams and coursework to be a teacher. Um, they could be uh, you know, eligible ready to be a paraprofessional. Uh, if, you pa if you pass the LAST, for example, and have a certain number of you know, credits and a bachelor's degree, you could already be, a you can be a paraprofessional. Um, have we been in touch with CUNY and our teaching preparatory institutions about tapping into that pipeline to help fill some of the staffing challenges and gaps and to maybe work with NYSID on the, the potential for emergency, emergency waivers uh, to help address, address the needs in our schools? Chair, yes, we, we have our human resources um, department and uh, teacher recruitment unit have been in contact with higher ed institutions to do just that. Um, I have to really speak on their behalf. They have done so much to look at every possibility, including incentives and so on, to ensure that we have that pipeline. Um, in fact, schools have been hiring some folks as well as permanent employees within that scope. Um, just to kind of, uh, is there a plan this year uh, and forgive me if I missed this, I just I want to just get clarity. Is there a plan this year to uh, implement and conduct the traditional uh, learning survey that's, that DOE asks schools to conduct each school year, definitely prior to the pandemic? Is that still happening this year? Yes, Chair, that will continue to move forward. And Dr. Chen, when, when does that survey uh, come out? Um... That survey, um, I need to just double check the timelines on that, but generally we collect the information this spring and then it's released the following year um, together with the school quality snapshot and reports so that all the information is shared together and I can get back to you on timelines on that. And Dr. Chen, has, has this survey been tweaked and adjusted to kind of meet the reality of, of today, because the survey was designed prior to the pandemic and a lot of our kids and staff are facing a whole new host of challenges and, and issues. And uh, has that been tweaked? And also, how can we you know, better use these types of surveys to kind of get real time feedback from our school communities to kind of better meet them where they're at? Because just anecdotally, I speak to schools literally every day and I kind of hear about the issues and challenges which they're facing. It'll be more, I think, impactful, helpful to have a macro look at the school system as a whole um, about where, where things are at. Has there been a conversation about adjusting this survey um, to kind of meet the moment that we're in rather than the traditional survey prior to the pandemic? Yes, Chair, uh, you're, you're absolutely right about that. We do tweak um, some of the questions because it, it needs to, as you said, be relevant to the times, not just business as usual. Um, I want to also emphasize too, in addition to, and, and perhaps my colleague Adrian Austin can speak more to this, but in addition to the surveys, um, we have also been engaging and expanded expanded um, community and, and family engagement 
And this has been happening more than ever through the use of technology. And so we also have other input and feedback and interaction that's coming in as well. Um, Deputy Chancellor Austin, would you like to say more about those ongoing efforts that you and your team have been involved in? Uh, certainly, thank you, Dr. Chen, and thank you, City Council, uh, for the question. Um, one of the, before we even received the funding uh, for the ARP funding and the foundation aid funding, we started to have these conversations with families. And so uh, this actually was led by <laughs> Larry Pendergast, who's here with us on the call, uh, and Dr. Ruby, but they started having um, conversations with, they have over 70 focus groups uh, across our system with teachers and principals and parents and advocates to start to do the planning uh, that we knew was necessary to build out a solid plan for what the fall would look like because we knew we were coming into uh, a, a year like no other uh, and asking everyone to step up, all of our 150,000 power, even a manpower workforce to step up to serve in a different way. And so that's work that, that happened early in the spring uh, and actually there was a really robust report of recommendations that was produced as a result of that. Um, and so that's what started our engagement. We followed that with a citywide sort of, you know, every borough uh, chancellor tour to do uh, listening sessions with families across the city. Thousands of families participated in that. We got a lot of good information through like Mentimeters that we did uh, in those events. We actually provided some um, sort of a, a broad sketch of plans for parents to respond to in that space. And then we allowed parents to sort of ask us questions or, or to offer us ideas about what's important. And we did a little bit of analysis and obviously looked at that as well. So that's some of the engagement we did um, in preparation for the, the planning that needed to take place for this fall. Uh, and then we're continuing to do that. And I know y'all know this, but there's a lot of engagement happening right now. Uh, there's a brilliant uh, New York City engagement happening being led by Senior Deputy Chancellor Rosales around uh, what gifted and talented uh, education will look like in the future. Um, there is some engagement that's going to be happening in Brooklyn North that I'm very excited about that's going to look at how we revitalize our leadership teams. We've heard a lot of feedback about our SLTs, our DLTs. So how do we really revitalize and support our school governance structures from the local level? Um, and then there's, you know, the, the other piece of engagement, and you all know this, I oversee um, several offices, one of which is FACE, uh, but supporting the, the new CEC leaders that were elected in the spring, 72% of them are brand new. And so there's a lot of work being done to both include, to prepare uh, all of those leaders for their positions and also include them in engagement. Um, and, and I think for the first time in a long time anyway, uh, the CECs are co-sponsoring or co-leading some of the brilliant NYC engagement uh, locally. So, so that's sort of just a, a rough summary of some of the work that's been happening. Could I also add, Chair, um, we want to also express our gratitude to you and the Council for the funding um, that you've provided to um, ensure that there's outreach and engagement with our multilingual families and language access as well. Yeah, and I certainly think we need to do a lot we need even greater investments in, in terms in communities that uh, need, need more help. But Dr. Chen, just very quickly, just to quickly follow up on something, um, when, when will the uh, academic recovery programs begin as far as after school and Saturdays? When is that slated, slated to start? Sure, our schools have been planning for this and um, I will say some have already started. I spoke with a principal yesterday who already started extended day and Saturday uh, work, but- <laughs> How many have started? I don't know how many have started, but I know uh, that, you know, I spoke just randomly to a principal yesterday who had started. We have asked schools to aim for the middle of November um, to be able to make sure that they are able to organize the types of supports and the personnel for the supports to do that. But again, every school is um, determining what is the right amount of time and, and those sessions for, for each of their communities. Um, are you concerned that there are still, and just so I'm clear, state assessments are still happening uh, this coming school year, is that, this school year, is that, is that correct? Correct, that is what we have been uh, informed. I, and are you concerned that if schools are able to set something up in terms of after school or Saturday and due to some of the staffing issues and stuff that we've already talked about, 
that this will just be kind of tailored towards more test prep uh, to meet, uh, to, to get kids prepared for these assessments rather than to really make up for the impacts of, of the previous uh, and existing school year. Our focus in the academic recovery plan, and it's, I appreciate the question, it's an important one, especially in the midst of, of all that we're, we're going through here. And our recovery plan is both um, social emotional learning as well as academic learning. And that is something that is, is incredibly important and essential to us as a system. And in terms of the academic piece, um, I really appreciate your comments earlier at the opening around um, unfinished learning because basically we've had interrupted learning for our students and some more than others. And as you noted, it has exacerbate, exacerbated existing disparities. And so our focus is on leveraging social emotional learning to advance academics for students um, aligned to the standards. Now, are the tests um, focusing on standards? Yes, but our focus is on making sure that every student can be independent and be able to perform so that they can be um, uh, to, to take advantage of every academic opportunity. Um, now, with that being said, we want to make sure we know where they are performing currently. What are their strengths? How can we build upon them? to catch up on that unfinished learning. Part of that work is making sure that we focus on uh, what we call priority standards. I always, I always appreciate a conversation with you because you understand these things well, right? Where if a student is to be prepared for this year's work, we need to focus on this year's standards and accelerate all of the things that are needed in terms of those um, core priority standards. And those are resources that we've provided for schools because there's so many things to focus on and we want them to be clear to focus on what, how do we get every student to accelerate in their learning, to address this unfinished learning. And that is our priority and to do it with the utmost care around the various circumstances that they are managing in their homes across the city. So I, I appreciate the answer, Dr. Chen. I just, again, want to say that um, to me, this is also a major equity issue because there are students and there are families from the start of the pandemic to now that uh, certainly some, some kids and families have uh, added resources. And, you know, and I, I certainly, I wish them the best uh, where a lot of these transitions have been almost seamless where they can provide added supports, whether they've been in private learning pods during the last school year, where they're hiring private tutors at very, you know, at, at a very expensive cost, and they have a support structure, support system uh, with means. Um, and there are many kids who rely, and families who rely on us, the, the, the government and the public school system, to be the to be the great equalizer, and, and to be that to be that base level of equity to provide that support. And I feel that we are, we're falling behind here. Um, and I, I just, in, in conversations with parents in my district and, and again, other parts of the city, um, they need more help and support. Their schools are still facing staffing issues, even in terms of after school support. Um, kids sometimes are assigned work where they need help from mom or dad. Uh, but if mom or dad are working or you know, uh, some, some children are caretakers for their younger siblings, uh, there's an issue in terms of, of, of a lack of support structure. Um, and that, that to me is, is, a part, is a part of this. And that's why I also go back earlier to that, the issue of, of attendance. In my previous hearing, there were parents who lost loved ones uh, due to the pandemic and they're keeping their kids uh, home, their kids under the age of, 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 a, of 11, under 12, fearful for their life. And uh, some are still waiting for home in, the home instruction uh, to, to take shape. So that's on my mind here as well. Um, it's, you know, we, we have to meet the needs of all of the kids, but certainly those kids who need a lot of, uh, who need more greater, greater support. I have follow-up questions on my bill and other items, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna turn it now 
to my colleagues for, for questions and um, uh, and I will I, I'll circle back. Uh, I believe uh, I saw Councilmember Dinowitz uh, with his hand up and uh, 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 actually Chair, uh, Councilmember Barron's hand was up first. Oh, uh, well, followed by Councilmember Dinowitz. So Councilmember Dinowitz, a, 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 the principal is going first here. Uh, pr principal, <laughs> Councilmember Barron. Sorry. Uh, thank Starting you, Mr. time. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panelists that are here. And first, as I generally do, I wanna have this disclosure on the record that uh, Deputy Commissioner LaShawn Robinson and I have common ancestors in Frederick and Lavinia Robinson, who were my great, great grandparents and her great, great, great grandparents. So I want that on the record. Uh, I'm very concerned about this topic, of course, we all are. Part of the tragedy of what happened in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, not Hurricane Katrina, but the aftermath was the negligence and disregard of this country in responding to the needs of the uh, people who were devastated by the breaking of the dam and, and all that, just the inappropriateness or the lack of preparation to provide emergency services. And a part of the study that was referenced in the briefing notes said that for four months lost in academics would require two years of normal learning to bring those students back to the level where they should be. That's a, that's a, a, a fantastic task before us. And my first question is, are all of the teachers, particularly in grades um, seven through 12, are, they, are these teachers who are certified in the subject area that they are teaching? Council member, thank you. And we so appreciate your experience as a seasoned educator and asking us these important questions. Um, and uh, I'll first comment on, um, so the answer to uh, the, the certified teachers is um, we worked with every school to make sure and we understand how important it is, especially for secondary to have certified content teachers for students to be able to earn credit and really gain that expertise from, uh, from teachers. I'll pivot to uh, Larry Pendergrass at, at a certain point here to comment more. And, about and if it could be very brief because uh, yes, I want to try to honor- Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, the, vast, the vast majority are certified in, in the subject area they are teaching. Not can we all. get a can you can we get a percentage by each of the subject areas, particularly math and science? Um, and, yes, we can try. It's going to take some digging, just because that's okay. happening at the school and classroom level. Well, um, we can't get the numbers of students enrolled. I have. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You well, can. yeah, but you know, I, I I have to comment on the same issue that the chair raised. It's an insult, I believe. And I wonder why you're not willing to share with us the data that you have about the number of students who come to school. We're not even talking about them. Who came to school yesterday? How many children came to school yesterday? And the fact that you want to avoid that is really uh, questioning the trust that we have with the data that we can get from you. And I have to say that because it's unacceptable. Uh, but to move on to my other questions, there has always been a great lag uh, between the college readiness numbers and the students that come into CUNY need remediation at the tune of 70%. Now, you may know that I'm the chair of higher education. I, I shudder to think what it's going to be. If there were 70% previously of students who came into CUNY who needed remediation, Moving forward, it's going to be a real task. And I think I've said it before, we need to have the, uh, a, a better link, a better trail between, a better connection, a bridge between the city DOE and CUNY where most of the students who graduate from our schools go to. So I just wanna say we need to be mindful of that. And I did hear you talk about, I think I heard you talk about the curriculum that you're calling the universal mosaic. Uh, and how are we going to make sure that all students 
but particularly students who have traditionally been underserved and underrepresented and not included in the curriculum. And I'm talking about black and brown children. How are we going to make sure that we have a, a comprehensive, cohesive approach that talks about historically the contributions that they've made to world civilizations and particularly to the development of this country? So in terms of the CUNY question, um, yes. we are, we, we are working very closely with them to make sure to address the precise issue that you have um, identified to ensure that students are getting all the supports that they need so they don't need to require so much remediation at the CUNY level. Also on mosaic curriculum, just very quickly, um, we are going to be starting engagement citywide shortly and then specifically at the district levels to do exactly what you've raised, which is make sure that every part of the city has a voice in what is represented and who is represented and historically accurate and complete uh, representation in this mosaic curriculum. That is, that is exactly the purpose of it. So thank you. Thank you. And if Ms. Chair, Mr. Chair, if I could ask one further question. Thank you. Uh, as we talk about the digital divide that continues to exist for black and brown families and the, uh, the problems with getting access and having connectivity, that's going to be an ongoing issue to make sure that we resolve that. And also particularly for children uh, uh, living in temporary shelters. Um, my question is, how are we going to use this point in, in this horrible situation to our advantage and make sure that teachers don't fall back to you know, chalk and talk, that they really understand the opportunity through this open curriculum of being able to access uh, the, the internet for current information. We're, not, we're no longer bound to textbooks, which of course we all know had great limitations. So we're no longer bound to textbooks. So what kind of in-depth professional development is going to take place that will make sure that teachers maintain and advance using the technology that's in the, in the palm of their hands and their fingertips and so readily available? Yes, that, uh, that is so true. And that's exactly what we're doing. We are continuing to provide professional learning for teachers. We actually also have um, continue to update all of our technology curriculum tools as well that that teachers can all teachers can access and of course we're continuing to make investments so that students have um, uh, Wi-Fi enabled devices to to address the issue that you're bringing up which is this lack of connectivity as well all of those things I think you know the pandemic has been and continues to be difficult but one piece of leverage is that technology and relying on that, even with families and communication with schools, as well as day-to-day -day learning, we're still leveraging that technology, even though we're in person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Council Member Barron. And next, uh, we'll turn to Council Member Dinowitz. Starting time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Traeger and Council Member Barron. It's, it's a little... Uh, Feel a little weird following up a principal, but I, I I will I will do my best. Um, so I I, I just have a couple questions. Uh, first, you know I I have Hulu because you know I'm a millennial, but I also have the one with commercials because uh, I'm a millennial. But I see a lot of commercials. I, I see the ads for vaccines. I had seen ads for school in September. Uh, I don't see advertisements now, and I'm bringing up advertisements because you know. It is, it is, I think, a great way to keep parents and families updated and informed. Um, so just a couple of questions around that. Why have these campaigns, these ad campaigns stopped? Um, and were you advertising in multiple languages? And it, for example, you say you're expanding IEP services for 3K and pre-K. Anyone dealing with services for students with disabilities know that there has to be significant input and engagement uh, with families. And we're talking with the families who are often left behind and, and often don't know or don't know how to access things. Um, so are, are you 
still engage in ad campaigns and 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 things like that on uh, different different media. Councilmember Dinowitz, thank you for also acknowledging the need to provide language access as well as um, information more broadly. I'm going to ask um, that we unmute Deputy Chancellor Austin to um, address the specific question of advertisements. Um, and, and I'll see you guys. Oh, you were unmuted, DC Austin, but then remuted. So we'll unmute you again. There we go. Sorry, thank you. I'm sorry, can you re repeat the question? It was regarding um, uh, why we've stopped advertisements um, for services in the, the DOE. The whole question again, the whole question again. So okay. sorry. No, no. Uh, it's, um, just like, just present. Um, that in the beginning of the school year, there were ad campaigns welcoming parents and families back into schools. Uh, I don't see those ad campaigns anymore. Um, I, I think these ad campaigns are vital, especially multi-language campaigns, ethnic media, um, robust campaigns. And I'll just say not to inform and engage families, particularly the most vulnerable families who, you know, you know children with IEPs who, who need to know their rights, need to know that these services that you're spending millions and millions of dollars on exist, but also for recruitment of um, paraprofessionals teachers and school staff, which and we know it's understaffed and we know they're teaching out of licenses. So uh, what's going on with these with with this uh, these ad campaigns? Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry to make you repeat your question, uh, but it's a really good one. So we spent a lot of time and we invested uh, quite a bit of funding into making sure we did a robust back to school campaign. Um, and so, you know, we got a significant amount of funding for that. And we literally used almost every channel, every channel that was available to us, we used. We used our chancellor uh, on radio spots. I know, you know, several people did radio spots. We were on bus, we were everywhere um, because we had a considerable amount of funding to support that particular uh, campaign. And so what you're asking is like, okay, well, what, what's next? We're really excited that we received funding from you all, from city council to support language access. And so we are planning on doing four citywide campaigns specifically with a language access focus. And the first campaign that we're thinking about is around special education. Uh, there's a number of things. One is the compensatory services and obviously the incredible investment that we are doing in special education. Um, services and, and the other, and which I'm excited about, and which I know the translation and interpretation unit is excited about is, for the first time, DOE is offering translation of IEPs to any family uh, so that, that, that wants it. And so we want to make sure that we're advertising and promoting that as well. Uh, and with the funding that we received from you all, we're also going to be investing in a lot of workshops. We're partnering with community-based organizations that will do workshops for families around special education rights and the process. And we wanna sort of embed all of the good sort of work uh, that we're gonna be doing in this area in the campaign. And so we're building it out now. We meet every week with a group of community advocates to start to think through and support us in planning for how we're gonna be spending that money. Uh, and certainly they're helping us also with the marketing piece because this is going to be a, the, the first campaign will be a very large campaign centered around special education uh, and, and specifically incorporating, including a language access component to make sure that our families who speak other languages other than English are included uh, and specifically targeted in that ad campaign. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you. Thank you for trying to speak uh, quickly. Um, if I could just ask, uh, I think, two more questions, Chair Traeger. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so I look forward to seeing those advertisements. I, I, I would uh, encourage you to, uh, I'm glad you're planning. That's a good word to hear. Um, you know, but of course, every day we wait, um, you know, makes it harder and harder for families and children to get reengaged. Um, so it's, it's clear that there's a big gap in math achievement. The chair mentioned it earlier that it it's, doesn't seem to be addressed in the academic recovery plan, but this is only in part because of the pandemic. Um, Children lagged in math way before, uh, way before the pandemic. So I had high school students uh, who, who didn't know their times tables. They struggled with fractions or like even the concept of negative numbers. Um, but if we wanted to hold remedial math skills class, it was met with uh, resistance, whether it was a, a staffing issue or we couldn't code it properly, the students wouldn't get uh, credit for it. Um, so are you looking at, you know, this is by the same, this is by the way, the same issue I had when I taught, reading. I tried to teach reading, but 
but the principals were resistant because it wouldn't count as a high school class. The kids wouldn't get credit. The school would be, you know, wouldn't look good for having kids out of those classes. So are, are you working to address these nitty gritty uh, barriers, these, these details, so that when we talk about academic recovery, we can actually give students what they need instead of giving them more time to, to do some of the work that they're struggling to do to begin with? Councilmember Dinowitz, thank you so much for being so precise around this, um, given your experience. And number one, math is part of the academic recovery um, supports. So um, in terms of the academic recovery, Sam, that went out to schools that can be used for professional development, enrichment, core instruction, intervention, all those specific things, we've also given them menus and things that they could also choose from that also address mathematics, including um, the screening tools to make sure that we know where every student is so that we can prepare them for this year's mathematics skills according to the standards for that grade level or that course. Um, and also to your point around um, the reading and, and especially as a high school teacher, you're right, sometimes it's all about credit accumulation, but we need to really be able to know who are those ninth and 10th graders, right, that have really spent a good portion, if not all, in the pandemic, in their high school career? Where are they in their reading? And that is also what the screeners will help us do. So I'm and sorry, and pardon me, and yes. pardon because it's not really getting to the, to the core of my question. I don't doubt that you want to assess students and find out where they are. That's kind of a like education 101. I think it's great that we're, we're doing that. I'm saying once we find out, and, and this is real life, we have high school students. I had them reading at an elementary school grade level. Are schools empowered to take those handful of kids and provide them with remedial education? I'm not talking about putting them in a high school region saying AP for all, putting them in an AP class and saying, well, if we put them in an AP class, then it's accelerated instruction. It's fantastic for them. What I'm, what I'm talking about is saying, can we teach, give students a Wilson reading program? Can we give them remedial math instruction and will the students receive credit for it? And will the, will the school be punished for providing exactly what the assessments say the students need? That's, that's my question, not whether or not you're assessing students. So the, the assessments do help us determine the needs and be precise and be able to provide those. And that's actually precisely what the academic recovery school allocation member, memo covers, right? It covers um, the ability to provide students precisely what they need, especially the ones that you're talking about in ninth or 10th grade. Um, and we've also provided training for those uh, Wilson, Orton, Gillian based interventions, as well as the provision for purchasing the materials that are needed that can also occur outside of the school time. So all of those things are provided and, and I'm glad you raised it because those are specifically what the academic recovery is about. Good. I'm glad to hear that the funding's there for Wilson. I, I want to make sure that a student will receive credit or that a school, you know, it is not disincentivized from providing a child what they need. And this is what I've, I, I, I'm asking this because I saw 14 years of teaching. Schools were disincentivized from doing the right thing. And just to touch on what Tra Chair Traeger said, about the test. Is it all going to be test prep? And I, I'm glad to hear you say no, but if you're still judging schools based on their exam scores, then they're going to target instruction towards test prep. And in many cases, the students won't get what they need, both academically uh, and in terms of, of mental health support. And, and so that's why I'm trying to, to get to this, which is, which is that the Wilson materials you say you're providing for high school students, which, which again, I'm very appreciative because so many of our children need those decoding skills are they going to get credit for that and are schools actually encouraged and incentivized to give that to students or are schools just incentivized to put them in you know the the most rigorous possible class even if they're not ready for it which i saw throughout my career and and i think that represents a lot of previous practice but i will tell you in this moment of academic recovery under the leadership of chancellor porter that is not going to be discouraged. Meeting the needs of students as we see it fit is encouraged, including providing the interventions that a high school student may need in reading. Um, now, I do want to address the question that an important one, 
which doesn't have a clear answer, I'm just going to say, right? As, as a high school teacher, you know that there are certain um, policies aligned with the state around credit accumulation. And um, it is difficult to determine what kind of interventions, like a reading, a Wilson reading, if, if you will, intervention, um, aligns to course accumulation in a required course, right? So, um, and I don't want to uh, go around that question. I will say that that is a difficult and complicated one given the requirements for, for graduation uh, credits. But what I will say is, regardless of where that stands, this is the reason why the assessments that we're um, requiring identify the skills that are needed for a student. Therefore, we are tracking those and making sure that that additional support for those students that you're talking about will be provided because for, this is the first time we as a system actually know who really needs those things. So uh, I, I'm glad to hear that shift uh, Chance Report is making. Um, I will say, I, I know it's difficult regarding the state standards, uh, but the situation for our children and our families is also difficult. And although it's a difficult question, it's one that needs to be addressed, one that I hope to work with you on. I, I will ju just say one last thing is uh, just also about the Mosaic curriculum is that um, I don't know what it looks like, but I certainly hope that it includes everything and everyone, uh, including, uh, you know, Holocaust education and Jewish education, especially uh, as we are seeing a rise in anti-Semitic hate crimes, uh, especially in stories that I, I, I don't have to share with you right now of my experiences teaching, but I, I, I do sincerely hope that that is also integral to uh, this uh, mosaic curriculum. Thank you. It is, inter it is integrated and I would also encourage and we'll make sure all council members get that information in advance. We are going to be doing citywide um, engagement around that and that's important for our families, all families across the city from every corner of the city to tell us what they want to have them represented but for sure what you're expressing those are all parts of the purpose for the mosaic curriculum. Thank you. And we'll work with you to uh, work on that credit piece too, uh, Councilman Dinowitz. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And next, uh, can we unmute Councilman Berkudenchik? Starting time. Thank you. Um, thank you. I uh, just want to point for the record that I'm not an educator, unlike uh, Chair Traeger, Council Members Barron and Dinowitz, but I did the best ne next best thing. I married an educator and I am a proud product of the New York City public school system. Um, I uh, want to start off um, by um, thanking, I see uh, Ms. Bender is here today and uh, we have done a lot of work um, starting with the former president of the SCA, uh, Lorraine Grillo and uh, Ms. Bender's predecessor, um, uh, Buildings Commissioner Melanie LaRocca um, to, to uh, build, um, some of them already open, almost 900 of them already open new school seats in my district. And I, I do know um, what it, the Olympian effort that it takes to get this done. And I wanna thank her on behalf of the other two people I mentioned for their hard work on behalf of the students of Eastern Queens. Uh, I also wanna echo um, uh, Council Member Barron's comments along with uh, Chair Traeger um, about uh, the, either the unwillingness or the un inability to tell us how many students there are in the New York City public school system. Um, we know that the number is down, um, but um, either way, it's not good that we don't have that information. I know that Chair Traeger asked for it at the last hearing. He asked uh, the first deputy chancellor at that time, and um, we need to have this. This is about as basic information as we can get out of the school system, and not having it um, several weeks later is... Uh, to put it mildly disappointing. Um, I do want to um, take a riff on something that um, Council Member Barron said, and that has to do with connectivity. And I, um, I took office, um, as I do all the time, and I'm, I'm making my last tour of schools now before I leave office at the end of the year. Um, one of the things that, uh, that truly um, bothered me was, was the age of the technology in schools. Uh, I remember visiting one school where the, um, the computer teacher showed me Macs that were nine years old, which are, um, you know, 
at, at that point, uh, you know, computers age out so quickly. Nine years uh, is truly ancient. And I, I want to hear from somebody. I don't really have a person in mind. Um, many of the, the laptops that I and my colleagues have purchased for schools um, rightly went home with children during uh, the pandemic. Um, and I am concerned, um, and they're aging, you know, laptops age too, um, every, all technology ages. And I'm, I'd like to know uh, what the plan is uh, to ensure that the technology in schools um, is continuously upgraded. Uh, we live in a world of connectivity. Um, we're hopeful that our schools, that we will not have to close them again um, for this pandemic, uh, but we, we can never be certain of that. And I, I do want to know what the plan is going forward um, and how it will be funded to make sure that all of our students are connected in school and out of school. Thank you, council member, for your important question. Um, and I think what we've been doing certainly is leveraging the resources that we have right now, not just out of necessity for technology, but really being able to upgrade and ensure that dated um, uh, equipment is also updated while we have the funding to support this. Um, I do want to make sure that we can get back to, we don't have folks from DIIT on to share specific plans of upgrades, but I do know that schools are always keeping inventories. Our DII team does support and look at those uh, to help them prioritize funding. I do see Larry Pendergast with his hand up. Um, looks like he'd like to add a few, a few more details in here as well. Oh, Linda, thank you, Councilmember Grudenchik. Uh, we just do want to say we absolutely agree. Uh, and as part of the academic recovery plan, we are have a significant commitment to upgrading uh, our devices across the city. Uh, this year alone, over $122 million has been dedicated uh, to, to upgrading and improving number of devices that we have and making sure they're all LTE enabled make sure that we're trying to overcome the connectivity issues that you raised uh, and that we saw in Eastern Queens you know, like as recently as five years ago. And, and so. All right, I, I thank you. My, my time is running uh, low and I wanna thank the chair for indulging me. Um, and I, I hope that we can get um, an answer to the number of students in the school system. I know we can count. Um, I'm married to a math professor, so if you need help, I am available. Uh, Chair Traeger, thank you um, for indulging me today. Thank you, Ms. Chen, Dr. Chen, and, and Mr. Pendergast. Thank you, Councilmember Grudenchik. And next, we're going to turn to Councilmember Riley. Starting time. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chair Traeger. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your leadership, of course. Uh, just real quick, I, I have to echo my colleagues when we were talking about the school list, uh, because I know, just like my colleagues, uh, I'm getting calls from parents who have students who aren't enrolled in school yet. And it's kind of challenging helping them out um, to get them enrolled in a school. And it's in late October. So if we could get that list, and I don't know if there's a projected date, but I know we keep asking every uh, hearing for this list and we can't get it. So I just wanted to you know, echo my colleagues. Uh, secondly, uh, to kind of piggyback on Councilmember Pregentic, uh, in the beginning of the year, I had asked if it's possible if council members could get a list of schools ha that have been underfunded uh, within our districts um, who have outdated uh, technology within the schools so we can get them in the budget for the upcoming years to come. Um, is that something possible to do? And lastly, um, I don't know if this is the proper setting, but it's a concern. Uh, the violence that's going on within our schools. And I watched a troubling video on YouTube uh, where it shows that uh, there's a lot of gang activities within the school. Um, and I just wanna know what is DOE doing to kind of address that? Uh, being that, you know, kids join gangs for different reasons, to be a part of a group, uh, to, to protect themselves. Uh, there's, there's different reasons why our kids are joining gangs. And if we have this new technology that we're talking about now, like social media, which is kind of being aggravated with these uh, incidents that's happening within our school, what is DOE doing to kind of address this? Are we, do we need to fund more programming within our schools? 
Um, I know there's great programs like MBK out there that I'm that I've been a part of or Aim High uh, that we just implemented in the school in my district, um, Bronx Health Science. What needs to be done on our part or collaboratively together that we can insist that our kids are coming to school and feeling safe that they can get the education that they deserve. Thank you. Councilmember Riley, thank you so much for your support and advocacy. I'm going to start with one of the first issues that you raised around technology. We will work with our DIIT team to see what kind of list we can get to you because I know we keep inventories. We appreciate youth thinking ahead on how to advocate and support local communities around upgrading technology. I do want to pivot over to Deputy Chancellor Robinson, who's her and her team have been doing amazing work thinking about day and night. And I can tell you, I can testify <laughs> truly to that um, around the safety and well being of our students, social, emotionally, and physically. And I'm just going to um, pivot over to her to, to respond more specifically. Yeah, thank you so much for raising that concern. And I also appreciate that you raised the concern from the lens of complete safety. Um, obviously, uh, every the, the safety of our children in school communities, that's a top priority. And every parent um, sends their child to school. I did um, when my son was attending New York City Public Schools and I entrusted um, the physical safety of my son to the school community. But I also entrusted his social emotional safety um, to the school community as well. And, you know, wanted the school to have a lens, especially as um, we navigated through this pandemic on trauma and the impact on children, children who had experienced um, a great degree of loss, separation, so social isolation, you know, that was the case um, for my son and children across our school system. Um, we've made gains, significant gains over the course of this administration and partnership with council. We've been able to support teachers and school leaders and um, trauma-informed care um, training. We've been able to work closely with educators to deal with issues of adult social emotional learning. Um, we've ramped up restorative justice in school communities to ensure that for our uh, middle schools and high schools, restorative justice programming would be um, in place. And that work is critically important that we're having conversations about responsible decision-making as it connects to safety, social emotional growth and development as it connects to safety. So I'm joined by my colleague, Kenyatta Reed, that can talk about more um, efforts that align with the restorative justice programming. Um, and I'll turn it over to Kenyatta at this time. A real quick, Deputy Chancellor, with all due respect, I, I do respect the efforts that DOE is, are doing, but what else can be done with adding more community uh, uh, if, Chair, if I could just continue real quick. Please. Oh, what, what, can, what can be done with community effort that could kind of help with this impact that our students are going through? Because after they leave the school, they have to you know, walk home. They have to actually worry about getting home sometimes. What can we do um, done with community engagement? Because we're having these town hall meetings now with uh, the principal and the community, but I think that the community really wants to see, you know, leaders from DOE at some of these meetings where they kind of could come to a consensus, what can we do to ensure that our communities are safe? Mm -hmm. So I just want to say, I do respect the work that's being done, but I, I do feel like with all the respect, we need to do more to ensure that our students are safe and that parents feel that they can send their students to school and to make sure that our students are um, enlisted in school also. Thank you. I, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, we know the need to do more. And um, from the community perspective, restorative practices are, that includes the entire community. It extends beyond um, staff members in school. It takes uh, parents to be a part of that process as well. It takes young people to be a part of the process as well. We are also expanding the community schools model which is directly the connection between the school and the broader community. So really expanding that program. Um, we have 100 more community schools coming on board in addition to the um, community schools that we added this year. 
you know, the chair has indicated that every school should be a community school. The community school model is being scaled across the nation. The New York City community school model as an effective model that's going to be scaled across this nation. We received word about that um, last week. So we know we have strategies that work. We'll continue to invest in these strategies, strategies that include the community as well as you're indicating, but certainly the community school model and restorative practices, those are all um, practices and, and a model that's rooted and anchored in community. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, DC Robinson, did you still want us to unmute Kenyatta Reed? Did you want him to add anything or no? Sure. You're thank, you, Chair, DC. thank you so much. And thank you, DC Robinson. Um, and thank you to all of you, um, city council members. I really appreciate the question that uh, Council Member Riley is really bringing up, and it's about our collaboration with the community. Deputy Chancellor Robinson and her entire team, myself included, we value that partnership. And um, Council Member Riley is bringing up the point that the only way to help our children is when all the adults come together. This is not going to work in silos. It's not going to work with just the quote unquote educators doing it or just the community members. We have to do this together. So we welcome this opportunity. Um, you mentioned things like MBK, I know PSAL, arts programs, um, things like our partnerships with cure violence providers and violence interrupters that we work with tirelessly. Council member, what you're saying is what we, we agree with you completely. We have to ramp it up. Like we've been doing it, but now is the time we, it has to be ratcheted up. So what I, I'm just taking this opportunity to say, I look forward to working with you and the other community members in doing this work because we have to, our, like you mentioned, our children's lives are on the line. Thank you so much. Thank you. And along with them programs, I think we need to add more trade programs also in our schools to just give our students more opportunities after they leave you know, high school. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for your report. Uh, thank you very much, Councilmember Riley, and I uh, appreciate your uh, attention uh, to this to this issue. And I, I also come at this from experience, um, and also want to say that some of the uh, incidents that we have seen and, and very concerning incidents we've seen also tend to happen around dismissal time, um, and that is one of the many issues reasons why. Um, we worked so hard, Deputy Chancellor, you remember, on trying to strengthen the MOU uh, between DOE and NYPD about the clear division of responsibilities and roles about who is responsible, because this is an item that I saw firsthand that historically there was some finger pointing and there was some a very gray area about responsibility. But the most effective thing that I saw during my experience was when DOE and school safety, NYPD worked together uh, on creating safe passageways and safe corridors for kids to get from school to home safely when they actually work together. Uh, and when, when there's a plan and protocol and procedure in place for folks to work together. Um, and also quite frankly, in a city with a, uh, an enormous budget, um, there's no excuse why there's no, there's no universal after school programming uh, to you know, customize to meet the needs of all of our kids, whether it's, it's whether it's in, homework help, whether it's in art, sports, you name it, um, there should be critical programming in addition to social emotional supports for, for our children. Um, and so there's just no excuse for that. And, and I'm a big believer, a big supporter in the community schools model. Um, and, and not just, you know, K to 12, but even beyond, even after school for adult education, uh, because empowering parents actually helps uh, their children as well in their schools. So this is a uh, you know, safety is a very big, subjective, broad term, and we need to have a more holistic conversation. And I really thank everyone for, for, for raising it. I also want to mention that we've been joined by uh, Council Members uh, Salamanca and Council Member Miller. Uh, and Malcolm, is there anyone else with a question on, on, on the queue? Uh, no, and also Council Member Rosenthal. Um, so now I'll turn it back to you for your follow-up questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Malcolm. Um, I have a question, uh, Dr. Chen, uh, with regards to um, 
can, uh, with regards to consortium schools, I have heard from uh, consortium schools that the DOE is implementing a, a, sort of a, a blanket assessment that even consortium schools are, 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 are being required to implement even though their schools are not, uh, they're, they're, they're exempt from taking the, the, the region's examinations. However, the assessment that they're being required to implement is tied to the regions. Are you aware of this? And can you speak to this issue? Sure. Um, so Chair, um, we first and foremost, we appreciate the consortium schools and the work that they do with, with our schools. And we've been talking all throughout this hearing on the screening tools that we are um, relying on across the system so that we at this point, especially in this recovery, we need to know where our students are, what their strengths are, what the areas of growth we need to really be able to pinpoint and really efficiently get to supporting with the staff that we have, as we've discussed, you know, folks, um, time is every moment and every minute is important. And so, yes, consortium schools, as all DOE schools, have been required to select uh, a, a screening tool. And they have gone through the same process as all schools, where there is also a superintendent exception process that was part of this selection process. And any school that wanted to um, appeal on that behalf, uh, we shared the criteria with them, which was essentially a valid and reliable measure and one in which the data could be collected centrally. Um, and uh, consortium schools, as with all other schools, went through that process and um, were asked to provide that information. Now, what they do with their PBATs and so on, all that rich work, nothing prohibits them from doing that, but we do need to have the systems wellness check, if you will, on academics um, to make sure at, and, and recall the conversation we just had with Councilman Dinowitz, like in order to know what students need that, that specific reading support, we're going to, uh, the screeners do provide that kind of indication so that we can really catch every student. But Dr. Chen, there, there's, there's irony here because consortium schools to their credit have been able to show us and the public that there are there are actually more effective ways of assessing, gauging, learning, teaching practices uh, without the use of the standardized exams such as the Regents exam. And I feel that we almost have it backwards here that rather than telling them to use a screener that is tied to a Regents, why don't we pick up the phone and ask them what are they doing uh, to get formative, you know, formative data and formative information without, you know, we're called low stakes mm -hmm. assessments to kind of gauge where kids are at and to kind of use that feedback to kind of modify and improve our instructional agenda and practice. Uh, are you following my, my thinking I here? Am. I am, and I appreciate you um, emphasizing that these are low stakes assessments. These are, these are not regents that we're giving students. This is simply um, another piece of information that can inform consortium schools and other schools doing some similar work in tandem with the other pieces of information they're checking. So I will say there are other schools who have similar practices, maybe not under the auspices of consortium. And um, you know, some, some of our schools have those other particular assessments that they continue to use. Other schools have used some of the very ones that, that are being identified as the universal screeners now. And I know there's some changes here. And what I've learned from other schools is that, you know, that yes, um, it's hard to be required to do something. And I'm gonna say that as a former empowerment principal, I understand that. However, we are in a moment where we really have to responsibly be able to know where every student is. And this additional information helps consortium schools and all schools have those multiple sources of information. And I do um, agree with you. We need to and will continue to learn alongside consortium schools on the longer process of, and I know the state is considering this right now, right? They are considering what are different alternative forms of assessment that could be used that are much more authentic 
And I think consortium schools have a lot to contribute to that conversation moving forward as well. Yeah, I, you know, we, we hear that the term alternative form of assessment, to me, it's more about like research-based assessments and stuff that actually works. Um, and I, I don't think the DOE historically, not just this administration historically, has ever really put in the time, energy, resources to really work with schools to create our own kind of uh, assessment tools that are not reliant on these standardized exams or something that's driven by some consultant who never taught a, a day in their life in a school. Um, that could be a very enriching opportunity and activity for schools to undertake. And if that's if we had trust and faith in our schools to work together to actually do this, because I observed a PBAT, not to go off on a tangent here, but I, I observed a PBAT, I observed as someone who used to teach a regents class and, and, and you know, uh, proctor regents exams, the PBAT was far more comprehensive than any regents exam I've ever seen. Um, and so I think we have a lot to learn from consortium and not the other way around. But I wanna get back to, to, to certain things here, uh, busing. And then I have some questions on, on, on the bill, which I have to get to. Um, we have heard many stories of children with IEPs who have still have not been assigned a bus route. Do we have data? How many IEP students have an assigned bus route and how many are still waiting for an assigned bus route? Chair, thank you for um, focusing on an important aspect that often um, intersects with school opening, which is busing and making sure that we can get our students with disabilities to and from school safely and on time. Um, at this time, um, I, I think we will need to get more specific information back to you. Kevin and his team are not on this call, uh, but I don't know if Larry wants to add anything else at the moment to this, uh, but it is an important question and it is information we wanna make sure we get to you. Uh, I, don't, I don't have too much more to add here. I, I do know, I don't believe that that's on, I'm pretty confident that they can speak to the busing and that the, the students are being provided for, uh, but Ke Kevin and his team can come back with more specific details. I, I just want to state, you know, we're, we're talking, we're supposed to have you know, this hearing about academic recovery. Um, I am hearing some outright horror stories for children who are legally required to have bus services um, it's a combination of things. Uh, kids who still have not been assigned a bus route um, due to the power professional uh, uh, sh shortage and staffing issue. Um, there are some school students that actually need that power to be with them. And because there's no power, they cannot uh, get the services. Um, some companies who are continuously neglecting uh, their responsible, uh, their, their responsibilities as far as they've been, they're being paid by the city for bus routes, um, drivers not showing up, missed stops, continue things, um, which completely, you know, takes away that child's education. But even if they come late to school, completely ruins the rest of their day. Um, and so just wanted just to make sure that we are holding these bus companies accountable. Um, and uh, and I, I will be more than uh, happy to follow up additionally with Kevin uh, Moran, who I will say has been pretty responsive to, to my yes. office and me, uh, and I want that noted for the record, but I actually, my issue that, it, that I'm having right now is with these bus companies that continuously, uh, I think are continuously failing uh, to meet the needs of our children and also the ability for OPT uh, to, um, in, in a timely fashion, uh, get these routes assigned or adjusted uh, accordingly. I want to I want to move on to to uh, to the bill, um, Dr. Chen. I mentioned in my earlier uh, uh, testimony um, that the last time we actually looked at the administrative code in terms of school building occupancy was actually before. World War II. Are, are you are you uh, aware aware of that, sir? I can't 
say that I am, but I appreciate you um, educating us all on these aspects. Uh, that's, that's the last time that this code has actually been, uh, you know, which I'll say, looked at, at, at with a close lens and, and changes made uh, to, to the city's uh, school building occupancy code. Um, and the issue of that time, according to uh, our research understanding, was tuberculosis. Uh, would you agree that the world has greatly changed since the 1930s uh, and tuberculosis is not the biggest public health risk facing our kids and families today? Is, is that correct? Yes. And I do want to also invite my colleagues on the line who have much more knowledge about the topic than I do, um, and we'll have them chime in as well. Right. And you mentioned earlier that uh, the proposed bill would require or would create uh, an additional seat need of over 200,000 students. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, and I'm sorry, sir. If you yeah. could indulge me. Please. Uh, I was just in touch with Kevin. He says all students registered by the first day of school have busing. We've been working through staffing issues giving vendors flexibility by doubling up on routes and adding more students to routes, but he wants you to know he will follow up with your office. Uh, um, well, Lawrence, I, I will tell you that we still, we're still hearing some pretty horrific stories and we will follow up and I, I think my colleagues uh, will laugh. Matter of fact, I, I want to I dig deeper on this. Councilman Rosenthal, I see your hand is up and I see you, you have a case. So I, I like to turn it over to Councilman Rosenthal and then I'll finish my questions afterwards. Starting time. Great, thank you so much. Um, I, I wanna thank you Chair Traeger for this hearing and thank uh, all everyone in the DOE for all your hard work. Uh, you know, you're doing God's work every day. So thank you for that. Um, I, I, and I apologize for jumping on late, but I did just hear you talking about the busing. I've got a number of cases in my district with um, for, for parents with special ed kids who are not getting any help from the DOE. I've been told, and, and this may be misinformation, but I've been told that they've been told they have to find it themselves. Um, and, and once they find uh, the busing, they let the city know. And uh, I, I can't really follow all the logic. Um, and I haven't dug into this too deeply, but let's be clear, busing is, has, is not solved. Making a sweeping statement that everyone has the busing needs uh, met um, uh, is, is just patently not true. Um, I'm sure the vast majority do, and I'd rather you word it that way, that the vast majority do. <laughs> But yeah, council member also, I just want to say no, accurate that okay so um, we we did what 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 we were saying was that what the office was saying was that the students who uh were registered for first day of school oh routed. yes these parents were all registered okay, so, and they were day. routed so we'll follow we will definitely follow up and i mean what's okay. so terrifying of course i appreciate your following up with me i'll tell you the cases i have but again we're here as council members representing you know big districts if i'm having a problem it's happening in every district so i'll just leave it there but i really do ask that you follow up with me uh, several parents who are really suffering with this, obviously, uh, they can't get their kids to school. And obviously, the other quick suggestion is just reach out to um, the organization, two organizations. If you really want the full list, reach out to Advocates for Children, and they'll tell you you all the um, families that do not have um, busing, among many other things, of course. And then Sarah um, from the organization PIST, she can give you the list of families that have not had their busing needs met. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for recognizing me. I appreciate that. Sure. Thank, and you, also, for, yeah, thank you for bringing that up as well as Chair Traeger. And we really do, on behalf of the DOE, we do appreciate you speaking um, in, with the depths of understanding and empathy of what's happening with our families. And just even one family who is experiencing that is not okay. And, and I just wanna be clear about that. And 
we are going to continue to work harder on this issue because um, you know, and what the cases that you know about may not be all of them. And so we know that this is something that we need to get better and better at. I know, uh, as the chair has mentioned, Kevin is working day and night with his team to address these issues. Um, we are not going to stop until every student has what they need in terms of their transportation. But thank you so much for bringing that up. Yeah, I appreciate that. Here's an email address you can reach out to. Okay. Um, it's Sarah Cantal uh, Not. Noto, I'm sure you know of her, but it's P I S T N Y C at gmail.com. She's really got her finger on the pulse, as does Advocates for Children. So I'm sure you know yes, them. We're, we're connected to yes. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank, thank you, Councilman Brown. I also see that we've been joined by Councilman Berlander, who has his hand raised. Uh, I, I, I'll be happy to turn to him as well. Starting time. Thank you very much, Chair Traeger, and thank you uh, to the administration for being here. Um, I'm gonna go back and uh, follow up on some of the chair's questions about the assessment. And I guess my first one is this, has, has the map growth assessment been validated as a way of measuring learning loss? Yes, it has been validated in terms of uh, measuring student growth. I mean, however, whatever nomenclature you want to use, but what students have learned, it does measure growth. Well, okay. That's not a, that wouldn't, that's not a measure. I mean, I don't love the phrase learning loss, but like, if that's what we're trying to do, obviously it doesn't know what they had before. So if you, obviously, if you do any assessment and you do it at one point in time, and then you do it at another point in time, of course, it can tell you growth between the two things, but that's not the same as a as some validation of its measure as an ability to help us address, uh, you know, quote unquote, learning loss, is it? it? It identifies what students know and need to know in terms of the grade level that they're in. And it, it's a computer adaptive assessment, so it will constantly give questions to really calibrate and be precise about what a student does know and what the needs are. Okay, so but I'm just being clear, like many, many assessments do that, correct? Yes, uh, and we've tried to make sure we pick so, um, ones that can be done efficiently and also um, reliably, yes. Okay, but I'm just going to flag, like that's not, that speaks in no way to kind of broad issues of pandemic learning loss. It's just a tool for assessing where students are that then enables them to be assessed at some future point in time as well. It identifies what a student needs, and I suppose you could translate into loss. Um, I agree with you. That's not the term that we uh, prefer either. I think the chair's term around, uh, you know, in unfinished learning is more precise. But, but I mean, look, I don't like, I mean, you know, I guess my question here is there are many ways of assessing where students are um, and how schools can, teachers can support them in their next, you know, periods of growth. So I just, I really don't understand why we wouldn't allow schools to choose assessment approaches that align with their broader pedagogical philosophies. I, I guess it's my understanding, I know the chair mentioned the consortium schools, but it's my understanding that high schools well beyond the consortium schools also requested the opportunity to use assessment approaches that align with their pedagogical philosophies other than MAP and that none of them were allowed to do so. Is that correct? So it is true that um, every school was given the opportunity to select from a, a small number. Again, we focused on um, the efficiency and reliability of the tools. We also um, deliberately looked at which, which schools were already using, right? So we didn't pick, the, the small menu did not consist of something that no school was using. Um, there are a number of schools who already were using some of the those ones. schools that that have approaches and proposed to use tools other than map. Um, they were all denied the opportunity to use an assessment approach. The consortium schools were denied. And I know a number of other individual schools were denied their request to use an assessment tool that they believe best aligned with the pedagogical approach of their school. Every school has an assessment plan and they are not denied the ability to use those tools that they want to help. They, they, many, they really come on, many schools, I don't want to fight about this. Just, I mean, yes, you guys denied many high schools 
who requested to use alternative assessments. That was the consortium schools, but not only the consortium schools, correct? For, for the purposes of this universal screener, correct. They were all required. I mean, and obviously they can use both this screener and other assessments, but like these are schools in particular that aren't looking to multiply assessment approaches. They're looking to align assessment with the pedagogical approaches that their schools take. And the idea that one universal computerized system that could be used from Tweed is required for efficiency over what principals and school communities believe is best for their students. Uh, you know, I, it just, that makes no sense to me. Like the whole reason that we have principals who are, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I appreciate your acknowledging that all the high schools that asked to do it were rejected. How many was that? Every school is required to. No, no. How many were rejected? How, how many high schools requested to use an alternative screening tool instead of map growth? and were rejected from doing that. I don't have the numbers of the schools that um, on on hand, but we can provide- Will you follow up to give the committee that number? Sure. Okay, and, and Chair, I know you care about this as well. My, my time has expired, but I'll just say, it's also my understanding that individual parents who didn't want map growth used uh, that that principals were denied any opportunity that like parents, if they basically didn't believe in the screener, essentially had to keep their kids home that day, kind of at their own. Anyway, I, I, it is very important that we provide good tools to all schools, but I think requiring map growth, which had no specific or particular validation for a tool at this point in time and denying all schools that wanted to use an alternative approach um, and parents who wanted to view it differently from any opportunity to do so, it's just not consistent with supporting schools to be there, to do their best at helping their students succeed and thrive, and instead prioritize the kind of centralized approach, the value of which really honestly escapes me here. So um, I appreciate your letting us know the number of schools at the different levels who asked to do it uh, and that were denied. And I just, you know, will continue to ask you, like you, you helped build a system uh, you know, through the consortium schools, through schools that take alternative assessment approaches, through an understanding that diminishing um, universal and standardized assessment approaches is not always what is best for building strong, supportive pedagogical school communities. This is a mistake. So um, I will leave it there. And I thank you for the time. Just to be more um, accurate, um, MAP was not the only option. So also schools, um, including some high schools, engaged in other assessments like Star Renaissance. So it was not the only option on the table. Were there any options at all that high schools proposed that you had not previously designated that you allowed any schools to use? I can double check that. Um, but again, the criteria were reliable and valid. No, answer my, I, I understand, but you, you, you rejected every, I mean, unless you want to tell me where, it's my understanding that principals who care enormously about this set of questions and proposed alternative tools that you rejected every one of them? Um, I have to double check to, to see if that is the, the truth, but I do know that there were other alternatives that they did select. Um, and to your point, we will provide that information for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councilman Wander. And uh, I agree with the councilman that there are uh, you know, schools that have taken it upon themselves uh, to you know, build capacity to kind of come up with, I actually think more effective research-based ways of gauging where, where kids are at. And also for the record, Dr. Chan, I think I mentioned this before, when I was a high school teacher, I didn't need a fancy expensive exam or, or assessment or to figure out where kids are at. Um, I, the first, uh, week of school, I would, uh, you know, assign a, sort of a, a, an essay uh, kind of assignment and, you know, low stakes, not, you know, not uh, hurting them in any way academically, but just to kind of get baseline data for me as a teacher to know where my kids are at. And then I would come up with sort of these individualized approaches to kind of better meet the needs of my students. The issue for me, Dr. Chen, was where, 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 do, where do I find resources, time, space, in terms of helping kids catch up to, to reading at their grade level, writing at their grade level, uh, that was the challenge for me. It, it's I, I think 
we, we spend so much money and energy on coming up with different ways of, of assessing kids and kind of, you know, and, and we kind of already know with a sense of where they're at. The issue is how do we better support them to move them from point A to point B? That's where I think we need to work on. And I actually think one of the areas that the DOE, in my view, has really fallen short is learning more from the consortium route, because I think they're doing some really innovative, good, good work um, that I think should be applied uh, beyond. But I, I want to get back to my line of, of questioning. So uh, just to go back, I, we heard that the proposed uh, bill would create a seat need of over 200,000 new, new seats. Um, just to kind of clarify for the record, uh, New York City is in receipt of billions of dollars of federal and state aid. Is, is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Uh, why aren't we uh, pursuing this issue of, 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 of class size reduction in line with this critical federal and state aid that does not come about every year. It, this is not something that is routine, but this is a very unique opportunity that does not come around very often uh, to uh, better meet the needs of children. So can anyone speak to why are we not applying some of that federal and state aid towards uh, class size reduction? And is class size reduction something that the DOE actually believes in? Uh, curious to hear folks' thoughts on that. Yeah, we, we do uh, absolutely believe that class size does matter. Uh, and what um, we also brought some experts with us Chair Traeger to speak to this, but we, we have a long-standing commitment to reducing class size. The current capital plan provides $19 billion in funding over the course of five years to create approximately 88 new school buildings and more than 57,000 seats. Uh, the state budget includes the first of the three-year phase in of the long promise campaign for fiscal equity funding. Uh, it means for the first time the DOE can afford to raise the fair student funding floor for all schools to 100%. Uh, that, and that means a $600 million investment in our students. And as we said before, the vast majority of that money goes to staffing. Um, it, we also have our $18 million that in partnership with council, thank you, uh, $18 million uh, investment uh, to work specifically directly in class size and early literacy, hiring 140 new teachers and 72 high need elementary schools um, uh, that money went out in the summer and the majority of those teachers are in place uh, uh, working now. So like the investments are there and we believe in them deeply um, and uh, the commitment, the commitment we're gonna make it, we are gonna continue to make working with our neighborhoods, our communities to make sure they have the schools they need. Ms. Mr. Prendergast, do, do you believe that class size and uh, the overcrowding of schools as well, do you believe that that has uh, inhibited or greatly impacted the school system's ability to fully and safely reopen and to maintain this opening? Is this an issue that continues to plague the school system? I, I think we have reopened safely. Uh, we had, the schools have done tremendous work in reopening safely. I think the data bears that out. Um, it, and I, I, as we continue to, uh, obviously with the new distancing, right? We, they present challenges to schools. We want to acknowledge that. Um, so I guess that's how I would answer your question. I'm not gonna say, it's, it's not easier if there are fewer there when it comes to reopening, but uh, the, the most important thing is that our students are with our teachers and we have done that. Right, but I, I if you could explain, you know, at, at the previous hearing, we, we you know, showed how the DOE uh, changed or updated its definition of how they measure, you know, three feet distancing uh, between students. Um, and 
are you, are you aware that uh, the, the way now that they're measuring the three feet distancing is from the center of a desk or center of a student's nose to the other center of a desk and nose, is, is that correct? Uh, I'm aware that, that schools are using roughly the center of the desk uh, in many cases, as far as they're measuring. In, in well, they're not, using, they're being encouraged to do that because it is a significant challenge to safely distance for students. Um, and as I pointed out before in that last hearing, I, as a teacher, one of the one of effective teaching tools is the ability to walk around in proximity to students. It would be a challenge Absolutely. to do that uh, with desks that close together. W would you agree that that impacts pedagogy in a class? I would. Well, I think it's important that teachers move around classrooms. I, I do, and and they can get to every student in the room, and they can check on work and have conversations and listen to students. Uh, with the current distancing, it, it's uh, where the students, where they are, like we, we are open and kids are learning and kids are very, very safe. So uh, I, I, I do think the pedagogy has been tremendous and the teachers have done great work. That's what I would yeah. say to the question. So. Uh, Mr. Prendergast, uh, the, the mayor routinely touts the, uh, the implementation, the rollout of UPK, Early Childhood Program, as one of his one of this administration's greatest accomplishments. Is, is that correct? Uh, I, I believe so, sir. Uh, and can you remind us how many children uh, were enrolled or enrolled in the UPK uh, program? I'm gonna ask some of my colleagues, do we have a specific number right now? I don't wanna be incorrect um, Is Maria Begg Robertson, can we unmute her to provide additional details on pre-K? Sorry, I was trying to unmute. I do not have that specific number right now, my apologies, but I can get it to you. Uh, yes, I would appreciate that. Uh, I just, I, I recall the mayor talking about how when he rolled out UPK, over 70,000 students or children were, were signed up and it was a, uh, a big accomplishment. Does that, number, does that number sound right to folks at DOE? Over 70,000 kids signed up to UPK uh, after the first year of, of, of his uh, first term. Sir, that was some time ago, and I don't want to uh, shoot from the hip, roughly, I, I think, roughly correct. Roughly correct. So it is, and I want to credit the DOE. I want to credit the DOE and credit the administration for doing something extraordinary, for implementing a robust early childhood program with over 70,000 children signed up and seated in about a year. You got that right. In about a year, our local government was able to set up an early childhood program, which really is a model. And I know that we had to work to expand it and to build it and to further invest in it uh, to provide pay parity and whole other and more supports for CBOs. Remember 60% of the kids uh, uh, are, are with CBOs and we appreciate them. They're, they're wonderful partners. But the bottom line is within a year, over 70,000 kids uh, seated in a UPK early childhood program. Would the DOE acknowledge that that is an extraordinary accomplishment? Sure, sir, yes. Why are we not applying the same big thinking, bold ideas, ambitious uh, energy towards the issue of class size reduction? If you're saying 200,000 new seats are needed, we show that we're able to come up with a plan in under a year to seat additional 70,000 children in, in a program. We have as you've mentioned on the record, we're in receipt of significant federal and state money. 
why are we not applying that same bold, ambitious energy uh, towards the implementation of class size reduction? I believe New York City in the year 2021 is capable of addressing an additional 200,000 seat need and getting it done. I'm not saying it, I'm not saying it will get done overnight, but as you've shown before, you can get it done where there's a will, there's a way. Can anyone speak to that, please? Yes, uh, and I'm going to go to our experts at the School Construction Authority, uh, but I do want to say just a reminder that the pre-K rollout didn't just rely on new capacity. Like we also used existing buildings where we had space, and but this. Uh, legislation would in fact require new building. So I'd, I'd like to bring in Andrea Bender, uh, Chief of Staff from the School Construction Authority to speak to uh, just what, what some it entails, uh, the creation of new schools here. Absolutely. So thank you, Chair Traeger, for uh, the question. Um, I don't know if anyone from early childhood is on the line who can speak to the rollout of UPK as it relates to um, the way that DOE leverage in the network of existing childcare providers to provide pre-K seats. Um, over a period of years, the SCA constructed about 8,700 of those UPK seats. There is not a network to my knowledge of existing community-based providers that provide mandated grades um, that we could leverage in the same way. Um, on the construction end, what I can say is that uh, as Dr. Chen mentioned in the testimony, it does take us about five years from the moment that we find an appropriate and available site through feasibility, through design, construction, until we cut that ribbon, it's typically about five years for a 500 seat school um, assuming that the site is a relatively simple one, that it's not part of a mixed use development, that it's not very tight uh, and other constructability challenges. And so we have estimated that to meet this need of upwards of 200,000 seats, it would take us some decades to do that. Um, we ballparked that we could build about 75,000 seats in 15 years just from um, a math perspective, it would probably take us decades to build out these 200,000 seats that um, we anticipate this bill uh, requiring. Uh, so, uh, Andrea, you've heard me say this before, and I'm going to say it again publicly on the record. I, I really appreciate the ability for SEA to get things done much faster than most, if not all, other city agencies. Uh, it, it, the SEA can build literally a new school in three to five years while it takes the parks department 10 years to build a bathroom in a park. You heard that right. It takes New York City to 10 years to build a toilet in a park, uh, but we SEA can build a new school within three to five years. And that's a credit to the SEA and to their team. Um, now, Andrea, just to kind of follow up on that further, um, you, you're saying it takes on average five years. Are there sometimes cases where schools or, or, or extensions are built in under five years? Uh, I would say that if we are building something that's an addition where we have a, a, a more, um, more control over the site or, or we have more information about the site that sometimes it can take less than five years, but sometimes even an addition can be very complicated because we've got a factor for the interaction of certain systems with the existing building. So I would say that five years is really truly about right um, for the evolution of a new school project from soup to nuts. Right, and, and Andrea, we've worked together, my office, your office, to your, to your credit, on finding spaces, in, even in my district, to build new middle schools and extensions. Is that correct? Absolutely, and we very much appreciate that partnership. And, and I appreciate SEA's partnership as well. And just imagine if we apply that energy and focus across every single district, across every neighborhood and zip code in New York City, I think we would find a lot of promise in reaching a goal. I want to be very clear. Um, the legislation that I have uh, uh, b before us now, this is our initial, this is our initial starting point. But we need a starting point because I thus far have not seen a concerted effort on the part of the greater part of the administration at, at, at really meaningfully 
reducing class size. It's been sort of about just catching up to population growth and growth of neighborhoods and trying to adjust to piecemeal rezonings in parts of the city. And we've gone through this and the council has looked at this before in reports we've issued in terms of, of school siting reports. But we're talking about not just catching up to rezonings or catching up to, uh, to uh, growth of populations. And obviously the, U the, the, the census has showed us that, we, that we're a growing city, but actually in making the investments to meaningfully reduce class size, something that actually New York State requires us and challenges to do to the contracts of, of excellence. Um, we're willing to work with the administration on a meaningful time frame that's feasible and practical, but we're not going to discard this legislation uh, because we need to move the needle on this. This is both from a public health lens, quite frankly, because as I mentioned before, the last time we've looked at this issue was in the 1930s. As you've noted, the world has changed. I believe, and as we've heard here today already, class size and, and, and uh, building occupancy has inhibited or an impacted DOE's ability to fully, to fully re reopen. I'm curious, Dr. Chen, if anyone has any data, how many, do you have data on how many grievances has, has been filed against the, the DOE, against the school administration for issues of class size overcrowding? Does anyone have any data on that? I do not have that data. I don't know that the rest of the team does, but we can certainly no. reach out to our labor um, department to provide those for you, Chair. Yes. Uh, Specifically, it's on grievances on class size, correct? Correct. Correct. Um, and we, we, we know that in there's a reason why the DOE has to dispatch teams, which I'm aware of, to certain, you know, to, to schools to kind of think about outdoor space and outdoor use because there's just no space inside uh, the, 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 school, the school buildings. So if I'm hearing that the issue is uh, uh, seat need, 200,000 seats, this administration to its credit showed it can stand a program in, in a year. If it's issue of construction, SEA builds things faster than other agencies, I'm willing to work on on, on a reasonable time frame to, to implement that. If the issue is money, we're in receipt of billions of dollars from federal and, and state aid. There is no time like now, the present, to make this adequate investment. I wanna work with the administration on, 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 on making sure that we craft this language and bill to actually meet the moment, uh, because I don't think we are. Uh, Council Member Dinowitz, I know you have uh, a follow-up question. I'll, I'll give additional, uh, just a couple of minutes on the clock uh, for, for you to, to, to follow up on. Just one moment, Chair. Maria Beg Robertson from DOE had more to add. Um, oh, yes. Had her hand, yeah. so. Yes, I, please, sure. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to answer your question on um, how many children enrolled in 3K and pre-K. So currently there are about 60,000 children enrolled in pre-K and 36,000 students enrolled in 3K. Thank you. Thank you for letting us know how many kids are enrolled in the early childhood portion. I wish the DOE can give us the rest of the picture, uh, but that is very, very helpful. And again, to DOE's credit, they built this, they built a program in about a year. Great job, DOE. Uh, Eric Dinowitz, I'm sorry, you're next. I'm yeah, Thank you, Chair Traeger, and it's it's and thank you, DOE. It's nice to have a, a number. You know, we're expecting our kids to do math. It's nice that we can count. Uh, my question is uh, just about our students in the shelter. Um, you know, we are we know our kids living in the shelter, living with homelessness, are some of our most vulnerable students. Uh, attendance in our schools has significantly dropped. Um, for students living uh, with homelessness compared to those in permanent housing, if you've seen any of the recent articles. Um, and as part of the recovery efforts, I didn't see it in, in the plan, but I'd like for you to speak about what specific efforts are being made to provide professionals in our shelter system to address the needs of some of the highest needs uh, uh, children and, how, and what coordination you're doing uh, with DHS to provide these these interventions and these services. 
Council Member Jenowitz, thank you for that important question. Um, I'm going to um, answer the res resource part of it and, and to just to make sure you're aware and then pivot over to my uh, colleagues on the specifics. So the academic recovery allocation, I just want to make sure council members are very aware that we um, weighed it based on need. And that comes directly from a lot of feedback you gave us over the past year, which includes hardest hit areas as well as students in temporary housing and specific weights also for students in shelter, in addition to other students, uh, students with disabilities and multilingual learners of various um, uh, needs. So I just wanted to make sure you knew that the resources are geared to follow the greatest needs. And then I'll pivot over to my colleague, LaShawn Robinson, uh, Deputy, Rob, uh, Deputy Chancellor Robinson, on the very specifics that her and her team have been doing uh, in, in response to our students in temporary housing. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Actually, um, uh, Sarah Jonas is going to take that. Hi, thank you so much, uh, Deputy Chancellor Robinson, Chair and Council members. Um, so, you know, absolutely really appreciate um, lifting again the focus on the uh, critical needs of students in temporary housing. We know that these students uh, face uniquely difficult challenges and they're top of mind for us, um, in, you know, in, in allocations and in efforts and resources. Um, some specifics, we have dedicated uh, 324 school and shelter-based employees to support students in temporary housing. That includes 100 bridging the gap social workers, 107 uh, STH community coordinators, and 117 STH family assistants. Um, we are also, as far as uh, training, I know that was brought up, how are we building capacity? So can I, so can I just pause, can I, can I just mm -hmm. pause? I'm, I'm sorry, because sure. I, I- I'm expired. Um, the, the, uh, unless I'm reading this wrong, it says school-aged children in shelters, uh, FY, 21 June of 21 there were uh, 12,000 uh, it was a little more than that the previous month but it's hovering around 12 to 14,000 even if it were just a classroom 300 employees is like 40 kids per employee and we're talking about some of the highest needs kids and then you break it down it's 100 kids uh, sorry 100 social workers um, for those roughly 12,000 kids it's one social worker for 120 of our highest need uh, children. Uh, and it just doesn't sound like, and that's you're right, more than zero is good, I guess. Um, but, but if Dr. Chen is saying this is based on need, it is just very obvious that people living in, children living in temporary housing, whose attendance dropped significantly and was already low to begin with compared to uh, children in permanent housing, need a lot more than a one to 120 ratio of social worker. And I didn't hear anything about academic intervention, but we're talking about academic intervention today. Um, and I hear about zero teachers um, in our working in our shelters, working there with directly with our children. Um, so I, I wanna respect the time uh, that Chair Traeger uh, gave me, but I, I thank you for having numbers. Glad you have numbers. Um, I am deeply disappointed that they're very uh, low numbers. And I, I would love to see those numbers increase uh, tremendously to actually meet the needs of our homeless children, uh, of children living uh, without housing. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Chair, would it be OK if uh, Sarah Jonas had an opportunity to continue? And would that be OK, Chair? I would thank also you. just like I to just want to respect her. time, that's all, but thank you, yes. Thank you, I just want to honor just her, her response. And I just like to say before she continues, thanks to this council, we've been able to increase the number of staff members supporting students and shelters. So that increased on the watch of this council and this administration, the increase in our Virginia Gap social workers, the increase in our um, STH coordinators, Schools also have infrastructure in place to support students in temporary housing and students in shelter. And we partner um, closely across the city with our other agency partners to engage in this work. I would agree 100% with you that there's so much more to be done in this area in particular. 
but just the efforts of uh, the Office of Community Schools and even thinking about how we're going to allocate the community schools, I think would be important to hear, and then other efforts as well. Okay, I, I don't doubt that effort is there. I don't doubt the, the hard work of our professionals. I'm just saying if, I mean, just on a very basic level, if the children and aren't going to school in the first place, then it's very hard for them to, to get those services if they're not in, in the school building. But uh, I, I know there's, uh, Ms. Jonas wanted to continue with something. Yes, please. Thank you. So thank you very much, Councilman. Yeah, so just to uh, continue a little bit on some of the supports and again, you know, understand and, and agree that this is about, you know, capacity across our system and how we're building capacity at the school level and in terms of uh, dedicated staff, you know, to support uh, the efforts at the school level as well for our students in temporary housing. So to share a few more specifics, um, we've really focused, I think you had brought up training and capacity building. We've really focused on uh, training for all school and shelter-based staff around how to help students uh, reconnect, particularly if, you know, if students have been disconnected, how to understand and implement trauma-informed practices, which we know are critical for all students and most especially um, our students who have experienced uh, trauma, including uh, students experiencing homelessness and training around how to, help, uh, how to help families navigate access to free public benefits to address issues such as housing, hunger, healthcare, and finding employment. We've also been working closely uh, with schools to help them powerfully leverage their Title I, uh, STH Title I funding to include uh, specific and targeted supports that would most benefit uh, students in temporary housing. So for example, things like purchasing school supplies, providing additional enrichment programs, or hiring additional STH dedicated staff, which I know is something that you named a moment ago. Um, I'd also like to just share that with, in working with Volunteers of America and in partnership with the Department of Homeless Services, our STH team provided nearly 20,000 backpacks filled with school supplies to our students in shelter the week before the first day of school. And we are working, uh, the Office of Community Schools in partnership with Ramapo for Children. We're committing uh, you know, additional supports um, around youth voice and leadership and how to ensure that uh, students in temporary housing are being recognized and supported in their own right as youth leaders and lifting their voice uh, to strengthen how they are uh, you know, leaders in their own schools and how they're helping to advise us in terms of the supports that we are providing to uh, students experiencing homelessness and their families. So just wanted to lift up some of those uh, critical supports as well, which we know are so important for our students, social, emotional, academic, uh, and overall health and well-being. Um, so thank you for, um, uh, you know, for, for that time as well. Thank you. And not, not to discount any of that work or that effort or how important that is, but, you know, un unless we are addressing their needs where they are, you know, specifically in the shelters with robust staffing, including the training, including the physical supplies, um, we're just creating another generation of people struggling with poverty and homelessness. We have to address this now, intensely now. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and if I may, I'll just add one last critical piece that we're also, to your point, continuing to innovate in our partnership directly with shelters, including uh, a pilot that we have underway to share, uh, you know, data tools with, uh, with our shelter partners that mirror the tools that we're using in our schools so that together shelter partners can work with schools around uh, tracking, identifying and tracking and providing targeted supports to our students in temporary housing. So I think that's a great point. And I thank you for lifting up that need to be supporting at the school and shelter level, including the coordination between the two to ensure that we're aligned in our powerful supports of our students in temporary housing and their families. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And next we'll turn to Council Member Barron. There Thank we go, you. you're unmuted now, Council Member. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to come back again. Uh, and I particularly, as we're talking now about school space, I have to give high commendation praise and thanks to the mayor to former, former Chancellor Carranza and the School Construction Authority for the beautiful new building that was erected in my district. Uh, it was formerly, the site formerly had 12 TCUs, which housed, and, and a part of a old, I guess, health department building, a two-story health department building that housed 500 children. So needless to say, it was very cramped. Uh, I want to thank those parties that I mentioned, they met 
and fulfill the promise that they would demolish, remove and demolish those, remove the TCUs, demolish the old building, during the time that the students would be moved, they would keep that entire student population intact in one location. And to those who have any kind of uh, connection to education, if you're trying to have a school in two locations, that can be disastrous. They committed to and fulfill the promise to keep the student population and the staff in one location. And they fulfill their promise to open, have a ribbon cutting for this fall, and it was a beautiful occasion. So I wanna acknowledge that, thank them for that uh, and say we have a beautiful five-story state-of-the-art building for 500 children. It's got a beautiful kitchen where it has two walk-in freezers and all the amenities that go with that. They have a cafeteria with pod seating as well as booth seating so that students are engaged in conversations. They have um, a, a gymatorium, which has a beautiful new equipment and not the regular bleachers. We have individual cushioned seats in our gymatorium. We have a dance studio with the floating floor and the mirrors. We have a cafeteria, I talked about that. We have a library, two science labs, two science labs fully equipped with a separate preparation room. And we have the library, we have an arts studio with a separate storage room for the equipment and with uh, numerous firing kills so that you don't have to wait for your project to get fired and you get to take it home. And we have a swimming pool. So it's a beautiful building. It's a model for what we need to consider moving forward as we talk about how we need to fulfill the need to give students, teachers adequate space in beautiful buildings that are air conditioned and meet all of the standards so that they can enjoy the environment in which they are learning. So I just wanted to, oh, and we have a music studio with five adjoining practice rooms to the music studio. So it's a comprehensive program. Right. Our students, thank you, our students are entitled to that, our staff, and we need to make sure that moving forward as we talk about class size, classroom size and appropriate space, this is the kind of model that we look forward to. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you again to everyone who worked on that project. I want to thank you, Councilman Barron, for championing this from day one to getting it done. And, and just very quickly, if I, if I may, um, uh, from the start of construction to the completion of the opening, how long did it take them to, to build this new school? Uh, you're, you're, you're on mute, Councilman Barron, you're on mute. You unmute me? Okay, thank you. In spite of COVID, the deaths, the delays, and all of that, it opened on time. It was three years from start to finish with the construction. That's three, why I really, three, three years. years from start to finish. They made a promise to me. They knew how important it was to me and to the community. And they met all of those times in spite of the delays and all of that. Yes. Three years to yes. build a new school. Andrea yes. Bender, SCA, that's extraordinary. DOE, that's extraordinary. You yes. get it done. Yeah. You get it done. It can. Yes. It, yes, we can. Uh, Andrea yeah. Bender, I, I see you have your hand up if you want to. Kudos on doing a great job. Great work. I just want to say thank you so much, Council Member Barron, for your kind words. We also are so proud of East New York Family Academy. I know the ribbon cutting was a really lovely, special occasion. We were so proud to be able to do that with you and the chancellor yeah. and our team that worked on that school. I would note that while construction took three years, it does take mm -hmm. uh, time for design and right. it does take time for um, feasibility and evaluation and due diligence of the site, including environmentals and all of that other stuff that goes um, into preparation of a school before shovels ever hit the ground. So, um, and in that case also, I would note that we also had a site that was identified for us and provided to us in the rezoning. Council member, as you of course noted earlier, the availability of real estate that's appropriate and in the right location across the city is one of the major challenges that we find across the city. And at East New York Family Academy, we did not have that challenge. And so that allowed us to deliver this project um, in a time frame that was that was wonderful for all of the kids who are enjoying that beautiful facility. Yes, thank you. It's, it's great, uh, but it, it's another, and that's wonderful, the collaboration between the local council member, SCA, the administration, 
But you see what happens when we collaborate and actually communicate and work together, great things happen. And, and here the, a space was found, just like Councilman Barron helped, uh, helped find a space. I helped find a space here in my district. That's how it happens. But the point is, in three years, three or four years, a new school is built. And that's, and, and I mean that, that's, that's, that's incredible for, for us to, to accomplish because other agencies just can't do that. And, and that's why I'm saying, I think that we can actually uh, get, get, get something very big done. Thank you, Councilman Barron, for, for congratulations on that major victory for your community and, and for the city uh, as, as, as well. Um, I saw that Mr. Tarotko uh, had his hand up and uh, appreciate your service and thank you for being here, sir, and please. Yes, that, that building was a great, a great partnership. And I remember meeting with Andrea's predecessor, uh, Melody, in the council member's office and, and getting all the uh, swing space at Maxwell High School done and, and everything. It was great. Uh, but I would like to just not talk about the 200 possible seat need and new construction. Have we considered the effect this would have on our existing buildings? And with all the amenities that the council member just mentioned in the new building, are those kids going to be able to sit in booth seating and enjoy the back and forth now with 35 square feet required per student? What do we do with our science labs that are built in fixed furniture, our auditoriums or gymatoriums? Uh, I, I just want to make sure, Chair, that we're, we're thinking through. See, I'm the guy that has to implement this. <laughs> so whatever comes out, I'm going to be in the schools trying to make it work for all our principals. On paper, if we're just going by numbers, that beautiful 500 seat school that we just designed and built now seats 300 people. So what do we do with the 200 kids that don't get it, get access to that beautiful building now? Do we lengthen the school day? Do we, you know, I, I mean, we, I just want to think the whole thing through before something gets signed over there and then we can't make good on it. So that's just my overarching concern. And, 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 and Thomas, I, I, and I appreciate that uh, concern. And, and what I'll note is that if I heard correctly, this was, uh, this was partly due to a rezoning that was taking place in that community. And that was my earlier point, that it should not just be a rezoning that triggers this type of planning and this type of thinking, um, because as we saw with the census data, our population is growing. It's documented, and, and the census didn't capture every New Yorker either. I mean, th there's a reason why we're losing a congressional uh, seat uh, over that, um, because we didn't capture everyone. It shouldn't take a piecemeal rezoning to figure out how do we build schools out. And, and that's, that's, my, that's my issue. What I'm saying is that when you have the will and you put the ambition and you put the plan and vision ahead of you, New York City has a history of getting big things done when everyone works together. First, if the administration sees this as a goal, I'm hearing from Mr. Prendergast that class size does matter. Mr. Prendergast, is that correct? Uh, is, that, is that your position or that's the position of, of, of the DOE? It's any pedagogue's position, I would say, right? It does. Okay, so that's, so that's great. And also, Thomas, just to go back earlier, that the last time we looked at this issue from a, from a building code standpoint, it was pre-World War II, which we, we agree, I hope we agree, the, the world has greatly changed. Uh, since since World War II, tuberculosis is not the issue uh, to today of our time, fortunately. Um, so uh, we have money. I'm hearing that class size does matter. Uh, you have a history of showing that you can get big things done. I am I am very open to conversations and discussions about how do we get this on, on a reasonable time frame. But we need to move the needle on this because I I, don't, I just don't hear any type of sense of urgency. Uh, and also I'll be very blunt uh, and just be more direct. I am not a public health expert, but from every public health expert that you listen to and read from, they tell you that this is not the last pandemic that, that we will be dealing with. Does that sound accurate to what you're reading and, and as well? Uh, do, do we want, want to respond to that? Well, again, I'm not a health expert either. So, uh, you know, I'm reading many different articles <laughs> and everything, but we functioned a long time with certain standards. 
if they need to be adjusted, that's fine. I just want everyone on this uh, hearing to understand that this is going to have bigger implications than just 200,000 seats and SCA going out there and killing it all over the city, which I know they'll do, but it's going to affect every successful school that's functioning now. Uh, it is going to affect the number of cost of rooms that they have, the number of specialty rooms they have, their class sizes across the board. The, the way we operate is right now we're, we're operating differently than we have my first 42 years in the department. Thomas, Thomas, <laughs> so, if, if I may, if I may. Are, are, are there schools today that don't have a, a library? Uh, right now, uh, the way we're functioning Buildings are using those specialty spaces as classrooms some periods of the day, not in our typical, say, post-March 16th or pre-March 16th, 2019 ways. They're using the buildings differently now. That's how they're able to uh, handle social distancing. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry about that. So, but Thomas, just to clarify for the record, we have schools that are without today, today, present day, without a full dedicated library. Is that correct? Uh, constructed library. It's quite possible we have some buildings out there. Yeah. Okay. And and if I heard correctly before, Councilman Barron mentioned that in this new school they're building a gymatorium, which means they're combining a gym and auditorium together. Is that correct? Yes. Right. And, and then there are certain schools that have gyms and auditoriums built separately. Is that correct? Correct. And that's also, uh, I forgive me. And, and is that also tied to issues of space? Uh, depending on you know what was available when that lot or that building was built, buildings are built differently from some space restraints. Yes. So we're we're making decisions because of space constraints. Is, is, is that correct, Thomas? That's correct. And we usually should be building a system that centers the needs of children and not centering space constraints. Would you agree with that? I don't know that that's a possibility in New York City, but yes, I mean, of course, kids first. Right, and kids should be first, but I don't think they are. And I think that there is a way, again, we, we have found ways to accomplish big things. Um, and if the administration actually wants to make this a goal and actually get this done, we have proven that when we're all working together and we're on the same page, big things can happen. I just believe that it is uh, in a question of uh, not if, but when the next pandemic hits. I think we've already heard from a number of, of folks how class size does matter in terms of public health, basic pedagogy, also an issue of equity. Um, uh, for, for, for children. Um, and so, yes, I, I appreciate the fact that you care deeply, as we do, about all the critical spaces that our kids rightfully deserve. But as you've pointed out, we're making decisions now, today, minus this bill. If we take away the bill, minus this bill, today we're making decisions based on space constraints, not based on the needs of kids. We need to turn that around. And that's what I think this bill re really does. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Thomas, you. for your service and also for your office's responsiveness as well. Many issues that we flagged. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I think with that, I think uh, Malcolm, is there any other member that has any additional questions? No, there is not. Uh, with that, we will now uh, turn to um, uh, public uh, testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And I would like to um, remind all um, uh, all public participants that we're limiting testimonies to two minutes. Please wait for the sergeant at arms to give you the cue to begin. And we ask that when time is called, if persons could wrap up their thoughts so we can move on to the next panel. But before we begin public testimony chair, we do have a public official panel. Um, so we first will be hearing from Regent Kathleen Cashin from the New York State Board of Regents and Sarita Sue Bermanian, Assistant Director of Education at the New York City Independent Budget Office. But we will first hear from Regent Cashin. Thank you. I'm starting good now. Afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Traeger, distinguished members of the New York City Education Committee for holding these important hearings today. 
When I was superintendent of, of District 23 in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, fourth graders had to take a multifaceted state test for the first time, which included reading, writing, and listening. The first thing I did as superintendent was to reduce class size in the fourth grade. In those days, the community superintendents had their own budgets, and therefore I could invest the necessary funds to provide reasonable class sizes so that we could better prepare students to take this important new state test. We lowered class size in all the fourth grade classes to 16 to 20 students per class. We also helped prepare the teachers by providing them with books in different genres and had them ask their students to respond in writing to prompts each morning following reading and listening exercises. The results were really astounding. The children in one of the poorest districts in the nation had the greatest growth of any district in the city in reading, writing, and listening. The key initiative that caused this substantial growth, I believe, was lowering the class size. I also noticed that a more manageable Damn. class size promoted collaborative planning among the teachers. This is essential because collaboration improves instruction and it promoted collegiality among the staff. I discovered that class size not only improves the ability of students to learn, but also improves the ability of teachers to plan and teach in a more effective manner. For the first time, they were able to manage their classes better. In that smaller class size, in the smaller classes allowed them to develop a relationship of trust with their students that in turn led to improvements in student discipline and behavior, market improvement. Teachers had more energy and confidence in their ability to do their jobs, which encouraged them to more enthusiastically collaborate with each other. This fostered a high degree of professionalism. My experience as district superintendent, and then following that as regional superintendent, it reinforced my conviction in the importance of class size and my understanding of the following principle. If you reduce class size and provide the right curriculum and structure, the rest will follow. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, I, I wanna thank you, Regent, uh, Regent Cashin, for your leadership, uh, your dedication, your, and for always centering it about the children and our kids. And even, you know, we're, we're talking about class size, Bill, but you've, you've actually been in this work, you've done this work, um, and I really appreciate your testimony. And can you speak to me about what type of support did you receive from the uh, department or lack of support or, or support in general when you were working on this when you were a superintendent? Well, you know, my team and I, we just realized that discipline is better, that teachers are more confident when they have the ability to teach fewer children, they're more prepared, everything was better. So it wasn't like I, I had control of the budget, my team and I had control of it. And when, I, when we were regions, we didn't. It was, uh, you know, an organization giving us money, but we had control of it and we poured the money into reduction in class size for the fourth grade at first because it was the first year of the test. 
I remember Chancellor Levy was the chancellor at the time. I remember him announcing it at a superintendent's meeting. Growth. And they asked me why we grew so much. Comparatively speaking, the growth was astounding. Reduction in class size promotes better behavior on the part of the children. They get more attention. The teachers are able to give them boundaries, teach them boundaries. Our, our suspension rates also went, went way down. Not that we didn't have consequences. There were consequences if a child should disrupt a class, et cetera. But it, we, our first and second and third option was not to suspend. It was to give a consequence, but to control, to encourage them to control their tempers, encourage them to have behaviors that will bring about a positive consequence. So you have discipline improving because of reduction in class size. You have pedagogy improving because of reduction in class size. The test scores improved because of reduction in class size. Teachers were happier. I mean, this is another crisis we're facing, if I may. We can't get teachers. Last week, I spoke with a lot of deans. I'm on the co-chair of the higher ed committee. I sp we spoke with a lot of deans. And the deans are saying how concerned they are about us getting teachers. Not only about us getting teachers, but keeping teachers. So coupled with the positive aspects of what our children receive because they get the attention, because the teacher can be kinder, they have the time to be kind, because they learn more, they have the time to help the children learn. But coupled with all of that is that teachers wanted to stay, they were happier. So the two things that are a crisis, first, the child, but secondly, the teacher. If we can't get teachers, we're in a lot of trouble. And last week when I spoke to all these deans, they were giving me suggestions on how to keep teachers, pay substitute teachers, for example, pay student teachers to sub. Now you may say, well, we can't get subs. So if we have student teachers who will be paid to do student teaching, which we're exploring on the Board of Regents, by the way, that would be a tremendous help to our schools. We don't want to break up a class. I mean, I, as a principal, I never wanted to break up a class. Never. I'd rather pull somebody out of a program than to break up a class because the kids are so disruptive and they're, and they're forlorn in a lot of ways when they don't have their teacher. But if you gave the teachers a real shot, at teaching the kids a real shot at having them learn self-control, learn kindness with boundaries. That was the mantra, kindness, but boundaries. And there were consequences if the boundaries were broken, but it wasn't throw them out, go home. I mean, where does the kid go? What does the kid do? So class size is a benefit for our children and they deserve it. A class size reduction is a benefit for our teachers, and they deserve it. it. Everything improves. Now, I will say this, if I may, just to go on a little bit more. The supervisors have to be around the building, and they have to know what's going on. They absolutely have to know what's going on. And they have to make sure that with the reduction in class size, is better teaching. See, because you do something that's really good, reduction in class size, you have to make sure it's implemented properly. And that's where the supervisors come in, making certain that the children benefit from that reduction, making certain that the teachers benefit. I did notice, I mean, one school was unbelievable, but many of the schools, you know how, Mark, you were a chairman, uh, Traeger, excuse me, I know you were a teacher. And I know that it's far better if, if teachers can collaborate, social studies with science, math, et cetera, all collaborating, reinforcing concepts. It's ideal, but that's promoted by reduction in class size. 
So it benefits the teachers, and we are in crisis with our teachers. And it more, most importantly, benefits the children under our care. Suspensions were down in District 23. Academics were up. And they had consequences. The children always had consequences. But it wasn't to suspend and put them out of the building. Our focus was to benefit the child and the teacher. So they go hand in hand. Thank you. Would you have any more questions, Chair? Uh, just one last question very quickly. Uh, uh, Regent, I really appreciate this. Um, we heard testimony from DOE SCA that space uh, is a challenge. I don't disagree that space is a challenge, but we have proven in history that we can overcome that with resources and the will and capacity to change that. Um, how did you deal with any space issues uh, during your time as, as superintendent? Well, I was lucky and honored to be in Brownsville. People were wonderful, but we were not overcrowded. We were not. So we readily were able to do this. But I also want to say about space issues, I, may, I really don't know whether the number is we've reduced by 200,000 students or three. But over this pandemic, the New York City school system has lost two or 300,000 students. I think we used to have 1.2 million. I don't know what it is now. You would know maybe 800, 900,000. I'm not sure. But we have definitely lost a very large number. So what I did, as I said, we weren't overcrowded in the district. I was lucky and honored to be there. The best time of my life. But you can find space. I mean, you can use space differently uh, in the building if you really look to reduce the class size. And But we didn't have to do that, Chairman. Honestly, we were lucky that we didn't have that overcrowding situation and we made the most of it. The teachers were happy, the students delivered pedagogically, the students were happy. You should have seen the parent meetings that I had. Indication of whether the students are happy or, is how many parents show up at a meeting. I used to say to the parents, if you have, and they packed, packed my meetings and I always provided the parents so they didn't have to worry about making dinner with dinner. And I said to them though, if a child, a younger child should be disruptive a little, please, you know, take them out for a while, give them a breather. And they did. Everything was better. First of all, it was the best time of my life. I'm saying it again. We did so much good and the underpinning of everything was reducing class size. And then pedagogic, we were driven pedagogically, we collaborated, we had discipline, but not the kind to throw the kid out. Consequences, um, and we, we taught them how to self-control behaviors, et cetera. We also taught them, and we tried to teach them kindness. That's a big disciplinary technique. You know, if you're kind to a child, they start to listen to you and they start to respect you and everything gets better. Kindness with, with uh, boundaries, I would say, was our approach to discipline. Coupled with reduction in class size, coupled with the ability to collaborate and parents being involved, because they were so welcome to the meetings, it all turned out to be the rebirth of Brownsville for a goodly period of time. And it was the best time of my professional career. Even the regions, I had 20, uh, um, 23, 19, and 27. 19 was East New York, 27 was the Rockways. Even, even that, as well as we did, and we employed the same, same strategies of kindness and boundaries, uh, the best time that I could really keep my pulse on the, on the schools, because we had fewer schools than 114 that I had as a regional superintendent, although the strategies with the region work there too, as best we could. Uh, and Regent Cashin, uh, you mentioned the enrollment numbers that you're estimating. The education department still is not telling us. Oh, I just read, 
uh, Chairman, I just read, in the, not just, but I have been reading in the papers, the numbers are way down. People are saying they're going to charters, they're going to Catholic schools, they're going to private schools. I thought I read a couple of weeks ago that the numbers are two or 300 down. But, you know, that I don't have any, you know, because I'm a regent, I don't have any privileged data that I'm sharing. I read it in the papers. And it but, wasn't just 100,000, it was like two or 300. But, but, but just clarify for the record for us, because I'm, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but I just want to get this on the record. There is nothing in state law or state education regs that prohibits the DOE from telling the public today how many kids are enrolled in the public school system. Is that correct? Uh, I, I believe you. I think I, uh, we, we lost connection, uh, Regent Cashman. I believe it's public information that you're entitled to know. I, I don't believe there's any regulation against prohibiting. We always knew how many children. I remember knowing it was 1.1 million when I was a superintendent. And yeah. I think it may have grown to 1.2, but yeah, I remember yeah. reading it. I got it from the paper, Chairman. I didn't get it from any privileged information. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they're, they're telling us that October 31st is this magical time. I, being a teacher, know what that means. I know that we are required to report to the state the number of, of kids enrolled in a school for, that it's for budgetary purposes, reasons, because if a student gets marked present at least once in the month of October, the school gets money for the students, and that's something that's important with NYSED. But that does not prohibit the city from telling us how many kids are enrolled. And I really, again, thank you, Regent, for that, uh, for that clarification. I really appreciate uh, you, you, you being here today. Th thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Malcolm, who's next? Uh, Sarita, Sub and I apologize if I'm messing up your last name, Sarita, uh, Subramanian from the New York City Independent Budget Office. Starting time. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair and uh, members of the City Council. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Sarita Subramanian, and I am the Assistant Director for Education at the New York City Independent Budget Office. Please refer to my written testimony on detail, sorry, on detail on the $362 million in funding dedicated to academic recovery that we see so far in school budgets and central office budgets. Uh, today's testimony will focus on IBO's analysis of the potential impact of the intro on city schools um, using historical data on the usage of space in schools. We estimate that almost half of the city's 1,600 schools that would be subject to the local law would not be able to guarantee 35 square feet per student, potentially affecting more than 103,000 students. Uh, the city council's proposal will increase the square footage from the current building code. And uh, following the proposal, IBO divided the square footage of each regular classroom and specialty instruction room by um, 35 square feet for all rooms in the 2019-2020 Principal Annual Space Survey. Uh, we found that 672 schools in districts 1 to 32 and 75 would be out of compliance. Uh, and in total, there would be a shortage of space for about 103,000 students. About 80% of these schools uh, were able to accommodate three quarters or more of their students. And on average, these schools would have to find space for 94 students. Looking across different types of schools, almost half of high schools would have been out of compliance, needing space for approximately 44,000 high school students. Uh, there are three important considerations uh, to take into account. Um, first, these estimates assume that the total area of a room can be um, usable space, but in reality, most classrooms have a portion of their space dedicated to classroom supplies and furniture, such um. as bookcases, as well as a teacher's area. Uh, in addition, uh, other spaces are available for conversion to classroom space, such as uh, uh, space used by outside organizations or large assembly spaces. Um, however, the strategy may affect school operations and the availability of educational after-school and community programming. 
Uh, finally, we estimate that the, um, the DOE may need to construct or lease approximately 3.6 million square feet of space across the schools. Um, and while there are plans for adding new seats, um, th th over 30,000 new seats um, since the 1920 school year and through uh, September 2024, that's still well below the 103,000 uh, seat we estimate for the need for schools, posing a significant challenge for many of the city schools. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, so thank you very much, Sarita, uh, for, for your testimony and for your service and, and for your great work. And just for clarification, uh, your, your office is estimating um, a, a seat need or as, as a result, result of this proposed bill of 103,000, is, is that correct? That's correct. And did you hear the testimony from the administration that they estimate uh, over 200,000? Yes. Do you know why there's a discrepancy? I, I'm not sure. I, I, I can't say because uh, I'm not aware of their specific uh, methodology. Um, but I, I can tell you that our methodology simply takes the square footage of every regular classroom and specialty instruction room and divides by 35 square feet. Uh, so, you know, just to be uh, very transparent about our methodology, I can't really speak to um, what, how they are coming up with their estimate. Right, and are you, all, were you also aware, because uh, we, we did some research on our end about the last time this, uh, the, the, the building code was kind of adjusted was back in the 1930s before World War II? I wasn't uh, aware of that specifically, but I do recall you mentioning that, yes, several times. Right, and uh, the, the issue of the time was uh, tuberculosis. And uh, we certainly would agree that the world has changed greatly since then. And um, also, I appreciate you mentioning that because uh, in the building code itself, it doesn't really reflect a reality that furniture exists because as we know, there are some, there's something called desks, mm -hmm. uh, teacher desks, student desks, and they just imagine as if these things are invisible and people can just be stuffed into a room like sardines. And so I appreciate your recognition of that because actually the, uh, uh, th thank you uh, really for, for, that, for that clarification um, and for your, for your report. And uh, if we will have some further questions and issues because in terms of time frame, in terms of building additional space and using these federal resources very, very wisely and strategically. So I, again, I thank you for your report and I thank you for your testimony today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sarita. Um, and just bear with one moment, please. Okay, so I just want to remind council members, um, if you have questions for any panelists to use the raise hand function in Zoom, You'll be called on in the order that you raised your hand after the full panel has completed testimony. And I would just like to remind, um, as we now turn to public testimony for public panelists, um, after you are unmuted, please listen for the sergeant at arms to give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. All public testimony will be limited to two minutes. Uh, An all written testimony will be um, read by committee members and committee staff. So please remember to email it to testimony at council.nyc. Gov. Testimony will be accepted for 72 hours following the close of the hearing. The sergeant will prompt you when your two minutes is up. At that point, we ask for fairness for all that are waiting to testify that you please wrap up your comments so we can move to the next panelist. So next we will hear from Michael Mogo of the UFT. The panel after that will be Tanisha Grant, Paulette Healy, Amy Sai, and Melissa Kay. And then the panel after that is Maggie Moroff, Randy Levine and Ellen McHugh, and we have more panels following. But next we will hear from Michael Mulgrew of the UFT. Time starts now. Thank you, uh, Chairman Traeger, and thank you to the City Council for having this testimony. Uh, at this point, after listening to so much of this today, if we cannot finally agree as a city in the middle of a pandemic uh, that we need a plan and we need an enforceable plan in order to lower our class size, I don't know when we're ever gonna get to it. This is absolutely absurd, some of the testimony I've heard from the city today. What I did hear is they're half empty, we're half full. I just heard without doing anything, we can get half the schools in New York City into compliance within three years. Wouldn't that be a wonderful feat that half of the schools without doing a single thing in New York City except sailing the schools, this is a priority, 
can get half of our schools to have the class sizes that the surrounding school districts have. And our children deserve that in New York City. I don't know what else to do except to say that we are fully in support of this legislation. Because when I, right now what we're dealing with in schools is class sizes have actually under the city's guidance and regulations, as you had a hearing a couple of weeks ago, the Department of Health has risen the class sizes of New York City from 34 to 52. They said we can safely put 52 children in a standard classroom right now because they have a new way of measuring that nobody in the universe recognizes. And if that's what we're getting from our city, this is why this council is here and needs to act. Because you cannot trust them to do the right thing at all anymore. The city has not engaged in this legislation. They have chosen instead to do everything in their power to try to kill it. Because, and I just want the mayor to come out publicly and tell people, tell all the parents of the city and state that he does not believe in lower class sizes. And we know why he will not do that, because he has future political aspirations. So for us right now, New York City, keep the focus on getting this done, because we know the only way to get the children of the city what they want, what they need, and what they should have pass this legislation. And I am fully in support of this. And thank you very much. I want to thank you, uh, President Mulgrew. And I mean, the way we're looking at this is that we're actually just trying to adjust the health code to the current social distancing standards. Correct. That's, that's basically it in, in a nutshell. We're trying to adjust the health code, which has not been updated when it pertains to schools since the pre-World War II era to be adjusted to meet the reality of today, which we all can agree that we're in a pandemic now, but this is not the last pandemic that we will face. And, uh, and that's, that's just... That's just uh, the, the bottom line. And President Mulgrew, um, you know, I am aware, of, as, again, being a former teacher and a delegate, even again, prior to the pandemic, that there were just thousands of grievance, grievances filed to the education department every single school year because of the just the number of uh, violations of, of class size issues here. But we can't go back to that. That no. is not the conditions that led us to the pandemic. We, we cannot replicate and do it. We, we need to turn a, a whole new, write a whole new damn book, right? And not just turn a page. And, and that is why this is about actually updating New York City's health code to the 21st century, to the world that we're in here, here today. Um, and I appreciate your, your partnership and, and also uh, you, your members for really shedding light on how severe uh, this this issue and challenge is. So we are not giving up. Uh, this is uh, this is going to be this is going to get very in, more even more intense. But we are up for this fight. And thank you very much, President Mulgrew, for, for your right. testimony and leadership. And thank you for your leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And next, we will hear from Tanisha Grant. Time starts now. Hello, Chair. Trega and council members, um, thank you for have, have, have given me the opportunity to speak. First of all, I would just like to say, Malcolm, um, I'm not just Tanisha Grant. I'm Tanisha Grant, CEO of Parent Support and Parents New York. Please address me as such. I represent the parent community. Um, I want to talk about some of the things that I heard um, the Department of Education say today, and I also want to lift up the fact that I think it's very disrespectful that they leave before um, public comment where they don't even listen to us and our concerns. Every meeting I am on, they are gone before we have the chance to tell them how we feel about our public schools, about our students, and about our communities. <clears throat> I want to address the 800,000 devices that um, um, Linda Chen talked about our um, being um, provided for our students. I wanna say that it is a lie. As you know, Trey Trigger, for the last year, I have, my organization has raised money to give black and brown children their own high quality laptops. We have served over 400 children in all five barrels and we are continuing every month. This makes our second October Chair Trigger. 
So if they have 800,000 devices, why do I have a list of parents whose children need devices, chair ticker? Um, I wanna talk about the academic recovery plan. It is a joke. It is crazy to me that the same people that tell our children that they have to show up to be prepared to do their schoolwork can't even show up to the council meeting and be prepared to give us the numbers on the children that have not stepped, school, stepped foot in school due to health concerns. That is very concerning that the leaders of the Department of Education cannot give us the information that we need to make informed decisions Time when time. it comes to our public schools and our children and our community, our, our school communities. It, as a parent, it is heartbreaking to come to these meetings time after time and hear the Department of Education gaslight us and flat out lie to us and make us and, and tell us that everything is rainbows. And, and we, I, Chair Trigger, I just went to a funeral on Sunday for my daughter's classmate who committed suicide. Where are these 6,000 school um, social workers and school counselors? My son has also lost a child, a classmate to suicide. No one has even reached out to us, Chair Trigger, to ask how my children are doing. The suicide rate of our children have gone up during this pandemic. I don't even hear anybody speak of it because this is the, the, the trauma that our children are facing and they are told that they are supposed to go to school and learn in a pandemic. There is so much more that I could say, but I have a, a few PSP and Y members on here that will speak for themselves as well. This is unacceptable. This needs to be done today. I yield back, thank you. Next, we will hear from Paulette Healy. Time starts now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. My name is Paulette Healy and I am the first vice president of the Citywide Council on Special Education. I'm also here to represent parents for responsive, equitable, safe schools or press NYC. Uh, the rollout of academic recovery programs are supposed to support children with IEPs that may have regressed and experienced academic setbacks as a result of the pandemic. As of right now, our students with disabilities have lost precious instructional time and services due to the ongoing staffing shortages and the failures by the Office of People Transportation to transport our children to their sites. Academic recovery cannot start without staffing in place. The intention of these programs were meant for an abundance were not meant for an abundance of assessments or to line the pockets of big testing companies such as Pearson's or Aperture, but that is exactly what we are seeing. Why would assessments be prioritized over the actual implementation of services? Is the DOE intent to tie up families in lengthy lit litigation over getting compensatory services instead of investing in practices that can go towards staff retention, like an equitable living wage and active engagement in order to sustainably address the existing staffing shortage. We have already heard the DOE double talk on how much staff has been hired and how many are still needed. The deficits are in paras, social workers, and special education instructors, which and the staffing shortages directly affect our students with disabilities. There is no recovery without the necessary supports in place. That means staffing, transportation, training, supplies, access to space, equipment, and an investment to develop those in support roles in order for them to have the opportunity to become better educators need to be in place. I also emphasize transportation because our children in D75 with developmental disabilities are bused out of their communities 85% of the time. Therefore, in order for these students to receive these recovery services, there needs to be transportation in place to bring the children home from the after-school programs. They cannot just walk home I'm expired. or get dropped off off. I, I literally have just three more sentences. Do you mind if I finish? Oh, okay, go I'm going to go ahead. Thank yeah, you. Please finish. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Um, they cannot just walk home or get dropped off at their community school on Saturday. And as of right now, we still have children waiting for their bus routes to get service. So we have no confidence buses will be in place by the time the recovery services are rolled out. Lastly, on the topic of overcrowding, we can 
uh, we can alleviate many of our overcrowding problems by offering a permanent remote learning option. Even though the DOE refuses to divulge attendance numbers, we as parent leaders doing the grass work, grassroots work on the ground know that thousands of families still refuse to send their children into the unsafe, overcrowded environments and are still demanding a remote option. Establishing a permanent remote option will reduce class size, allow better staff retention for staff who need the medical accommodations, and allow an appropriate learning environment for students that thrive during remote learning, including students with disabilities. I know I sound like a broken record, but in spite of the increase of ACS visits and continued harassment by borough attendance officers, families are still keeping their children home until a remote option is restored. Therefore, it bears repeating. We have 6,000 positive cases since school started. Our schools are just not safe. Thank you, esteemed council members and Chair Turgiv for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Amy Sai. Starting time. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening. Um, my name is Amy Sai. I am the Vice President of New York City Coalition for Educational Families Together. I'm also the CC member for District 75 Council uh, for a special needs community uh, in all five boroughs. I'm also a parent of five current um, public school students from elementary to high school. Um, we are talking about more than a half a billion dollars of uh, recovery, academic recovery plan um, that services all of the students, especially the students that I represent uh, for District 75, and including students that are inclusion program. Um, this is the revolving door of what we continue to see what had happened in the summer rising program, which the DOE continuously say was a privileged and beneficial time for those students. But yet, um, like my former, uh, my previous member here that just spoke about transportation issues and shortage of staff, the same issues are happening um, dramatically in uh, District 75 community, um, especially our paraprofessionals. And as you said, to, as you heard today, um, the DOE has not provided any data in regards to how many are currently in our schools and how many will be uh, interviewed and put back into our school so that every single child that um, do receive these services for a one-to-one -one paraprofessional or a group is received to their needs and uh, goals. In regards to technology, our children also need to be followed up with assistive technology. These are specific needs for those students that have um, a way to access and have opportunities to, to thrive in these opportunities of the recovery plan. And again, um, you know, Saturday programs and after school programs um, that are funded by regularly are not um, accessible for students because there's no transportation. And if this recovery plan does it does go forward, there's still no access for these students. Um, parents are put for their own pockets of money to bring their kids to school. Parents that don't even have a bus route or their child is arriving early. This is incredibly really addressed, uh, really concerning to me and my community. We need to make sure that these students are still not behind as again, students with disabilities has always been left behind a lot of times in communication and outreach to our families are not the same as uh, our general uh, universal New York City school system. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Amy. And the final person on this panel is Melissa Kay. Starting time. Hello, thank you for having us. Um, so um, I heard a few things, but um, you know, most important things are not what they always appear to be. Um, smaller class sizes is one of the few factors which will help educate students. But um, the first thing must be for uh, parents to bring their children into the school building. I am one of the parents who do not feel safe, comfortable with commuting by two trains to take my child to school um, with uh, reduced COVID measures and a plethora of other things that uh, we are not aware of. The DOE on the last uh, council meeting told us that they would have the numbers for the students who are not in school um, by the end of October. Uh, uh, we are days away from November. I don't know how much longer um, you know those things should be, especially expecting that we knew that this, this meeting was gonna come about and many people 
have been asking for these numbers. Um, another important thing would be uh, the curriculum. You know, equity in inclusion is very important. Um, students need fair standards across the board um, for them to, to all obtain that education that they need. Um, class sizes, um, I know from, from ICEC, you know, um, Le Leone has been working with Class Size Matters and she spoke at a, a few of our meetings. And um, one of the things that I have brought up, so in my daughter's school, you know, she's always had a smaller class size. Currently, she only has 19 kids in her, in her class. Um, but it's not just the class size. Um, so you also have that differentiated learning. You know, in her class, she's in a dual language class. She has students um, with IEP who are English language learners, um, children who are um, you I'm know, inspired. In, in grade level. So, um, you know, to um, kind of sum everything up, there are, there are more than, there's more than just one thing. Um, you know, even with meeting families with where they are, um, our children have been met with trauma after trauma and never after one of these traumas has um, school contacted to say, hey, how are you? Is there something we can do to help your, your daughter? Is there something that she needs? Is there something that will help you um, get over this threshold to bring her to school? The only thing that I am offered is a homeschool application. Um, I have been uh, turned down. My daughter has not received a single um, assignment since school has started. Um, meanwhile, I've been taunted, um, you know, with stress and bothered of worrying if the knock at the door is going to be ACS with a charge of education neglect when I, I am doing the best with what I am offered, you know? Um, I am not an educator, right? You know, these are professionals who go to school for years, um, prepare, you know, you have to learn how to redirect the class, how to uh, give the students the extra assistance and the time that they do need. I, I am not an educator, but I am my, my daughter's first educator. I am her parent. I am, I am concerned with her overall health, her mental, her physical, and, with seeing being at home where she's with me, where, where contrary to what has been said uh, before, this is the safest place for her, is her home. Um, I am responsible, her parents, we are responsible for her overall health. We, we are not receiving any, any resources, any assistance, any help, and then to continuously come to these meetings, as Tanisha said, you know, when it gets time to the parents to speak, um, you know, the DOE officials are not here. Um, the information that they tell us when they meet with parents and they talk and they have these discussions, and I would just love to know what, where do they find the parents who, who speak in these meetings, who they ask for their, their in, input on these discussions, because I've, I've never heard of them. And then when they do have webinars, there isn't an opportunity for, for parents to speak. It's, it's, you know, all you send your questions in in advance and it's kind of pick of, pick of you know, of the, you know, screen questions that may appeal that, that aren't too controversial. But, um, you know, our, our students are, are, uh, are really traumatized and, um, you know, for, for, for my safety um, and, and for my daughter, um, I, I have epilepsy and um, just recently I, I suffered another seizure uh, just Friday. Um, so, you know, it's, it's another trauma added on for my daughter uh, to witness. And um, had we been commuting to school, you know, this would have occurred um, in, in, in transition upon commuting. Um, you know, I've asked the school, could, could the counselors, you know, we have counselors at school and we hear these great plans that, you know, we, we've hired social workers and counselors and we have the people, we have the staff here. Yes, that is there. The staff is there in the building. My child is not in the building. How, how do you help? 
how do you help these students who are not comfortable, who are concerned for their safety, for the safety of their parents? What is being done to help these students? Or is my child only required to receive an adequate education if she's inside of the school building? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair, that concludes the testimony for this panel. If you had questions for any of them. Uh, it's been very uh, sobering, powerful testimony. And I am just uh, curious to know, when is the last time you've heard uh, the parent who just spoke, uh, Melissa, uh, when is the last time you heard from the DOE on how they uh, can support your child? Uh, because we're now approaching Halloween and what you've just described is completely unacceptable to me and to really everyone. Uh, when's the last time you've heard you've heard from the school and heard from DOE on, on uh, meeting, the, meeting the needs of your child? Well, we could have to us uh, re unmute. Oh, there we go. Go ahead. Um, I would say um, maybe two weeks ago, um, and again, that's only um, with uh, you know a follow up. Um, with me finding a um, homeschooling application, you know, which which puts everything on me, which is what I am doing now. They just kind of remove the the support and the resources that the the DOE would provide. It would just require me to do everything which I am already essentially doing on my own anyway. And how old is, how old is your child? Well, she's nine and she's in the fourth grade. Um, Melissa, I'd like to get your uh, uh, contact information. I, I know there are some folks in DOE who uh, their their cameras might be, they're still on the screen. Um, we need to follow up on this case. This is not acceptable. This is, not acceptable. Uh, this is negligence on their part. Um, so if uh, if we can sure, we have her contact info, we'll send it to your office. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And we'll send your contact information to the chair's office. The next panel that we are going to hear from is Maggie Maroff, Randy Levine, Ellen McHugh, and Marissa Manzanares. The panel after that will be Diane Ravich, Elsie McCabe Thompson. Lainey Hainson and Jennifer Goddard. And the panel after that will be Kem Irby, Carlos, Barbara Scott, Curtis Young, and Davida Losavio. Uh, we will first hear from Maggie Maroff. Starting time. Good afternoon, Chair T Traeger. I'm really glad to see so many parents here, and I hope the DOE is still here to hear them as well. Um, as you know, I coordinate the ARISE Coalition. Since March 2020, ARISE members have worked with countless families of students who haven't received all the special ed supports that they required. The pandemic has amplified the divide between students and disabilities with disabilities and their peers. I wanna to speak today about some concerns we have around the rollout of recovery services for those students and the literacy supports planned using federal COVID relief funds. Uh, first on the recovery services uh, to be made available after school and or on Saturdays, you voiced so many of our concerns in your own questions to the DOE earlier. So thank you for that. It's clear those services won't provide all students with disabilities with the compensatory services they need and have a legal right to receive to make up for all they didn't get these past few months or these past 20 months. Um, but the burden of seeking comp services can't sit with parents. Rather, the DOE should issue guidance to schools on their obligation to determine and provide comp services when recovery services aren't enough, and to parents on how to request those services and avoid the already overburdened due process system when needed. 
Also, while the DOE plans to set up sensory sites in each borough as part of the recovery program, as you heard, the rest is being left to schools to implement. Um, the DOE clearly needs to establish oversight for both recovery and comp service processes to ensure that all students with disabilities, regardless of the schools that they attend, have access to adequate additional supports to make up for all that's um, been missed over the past months. I also want to speak really, really briefly about the DOE's intent to roll out a citywide mosaic com curriculum. Two seconds. The plan is to ensure that curriculum is culturally responsive and appropriate, and we we agree 100 percent. At the same time, we want to be sure that it's grounded in the science of reading, delivers core literacy instruction and interventions in a systematic, scaffolded way that assures all students get instruction in the five pillars of reading. Without that, students are going to continue to struggle, and the city is never going to meet its goal of all children reading. Um, there's more in my written testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. And next we'll hear from Brandy Levine. Starting time. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Randy Levine and I'm policy director of Advocates for Children of New York. Following the unprecedented disruption in public education, we appreciate that the city is investing in some important initiatives. With our limited time today, I'm going to briefly outline just some of the areas where we are advocating for change. While we appreciate that the DOE has allocated funding to provide recovery services for students with disabilities after school or on Saturdays, these services will not be sufficient to provide all students with disabilities with the compensatory services they have a legal right to receive to make up for what they missed during the pandemic. Parents should not have to file hearings to get these services. We also have significant implementation concerns with how recovery services are being offered including that the DOE has not committed to providing bus service. We are very pleased that the DOE plans to launch a contract enhancement for preschool special education programs, but the city has not yet committed to providing salary parity for teachers at these programs, putting the success of the program at risk. We appreciate that the DOE plans to roll out the new citywide mosaic curriculum and want to ensure this curriculum is not only culturally responsive, but also grounded in the science of reading, given the hundreds of calls AFC receives each year from families concerned about their children's reading skills. And we want to ensure that students identified as needing more support following the DOE's early literacy screenings can access evidence-based literacy interventions. We appreciate that the DOE has hired hundreds of additional social workers, but are disappointed that the DOE allocated only $12 million in federal funding of the $118.5 million needed to expand restorative practices to 500 high schools and only 5 million of the $15 million needed for the mental health continuum. We are deeply disappointed that the DOE did not allocate funding for a comprehensive plan to support English language learners. Time expired. Many of whom did not receive their mandated English as a new language or bilingual instruction over the last 19 months or for a multilingual communications and outreach plan. And we are disappointed that the DOE did not allocate any funding specifically to meet the needs of students who are homeless. Fortunately, the DOE will be receiving additional funding specifically for this purpose, and we're calling on the DOE to hire 150 shelter-based community coordinators to help connect students to school and other educational supports. Just to wrap up with respect to introduction 2374, we strongly support reducing class size, and at the same time, we want to ensure safeguards are in place for students with disabilities, including those in co-located District 75 schools, who historically have been the first students excluded from school buildings when space is tight, and who are often already traveling extensive distances to get to school. We want to reduce class size while also ensuring there's sufficient space for students with disabilities to get their instruction and services as close to home as possible for their legal right. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Randy. Uh, next on this panel, we will hear from Ellen McHugh. Starting time. Good afternoon. It may be good evening by the time we finish. My name is Ellen McHugh. I am the co-chair of the Citywide Council on Special Education and a member of the Education Council Consortium. I am speaking for myself based on my experiences over the past 25 years. 
this point in time, you have heard a great deal of what the objections are to either the recovery plan or the concerns about smaller class sizes. There's no one in this room, and probably no one in this city, who would say that smaller class sizes is not a benefit. However, if you have a child in a District 75 program, you are looking at being excluded. If, as Tom Taracco pointed out, a school that was built to hold 500 will now only hold 300, where are those children in that local district or in a District 75 program supposed to go? Our cumbersome method of providing special education has created a rift or a divide, a chasm, um, a canyon, I don't know how you want to describe it. In the special education community, we are looking at children who are excluded, not because of any other reason, but because principals say, I don't get money for that child. Or because as a principal said not too long ago, I am reopening this school and I want it to be a good school. I don't want those kids here. With the advent of smaller class sizes, it will be exceedingly easy for those who are bigoted and they exist in this system to refuse to provide Time rooms for kids who are District 75 eligible. Additionally, there will be problems with providing rooms for special education services, such as speech and language, OT therapy, or counseling for those children who are in local district supported special education programs. It has taken years of tears and sweat, pleading, crying to have our children accepted as part of a community in a school. And now without really well planned, well thought out directives in this legislation, we are looking at an, we are looking at someone bullying their way through and forcing un, unequal choices, unpleasant choices, mean spirited choices, because children with disabilities will not be able to access their home zone schools, their home district schools. They will be asked to move elsewhere. Thank you for the time. Thank you. And our final panelist, and then we'll turn to council member questions. Our final panelist is Marissa, and I apologize if I'm messing this up, <laughs> Manzanares. That's very close. It's Manzanares. Thank Manzanares. you. Okay, sorry about Starting that. Starting time. All right. Thank you, everyone, for having me here. Um, I am a District 14 Community Education Council member. I'm a public school parent, and I'm also a mental health practitioner, and I work with many kids around New York City who are public school children. So I'm in support of this um, amendment, and I hope that you vote for it because we all know there is ample research that proves that students in smaller class settings can achieve better outcomes in both academics and social-emotional life skills. Uh, this is imperative that we put mental health of our students and our teachers at the forefront of education funding and policy. Class size reduction is one of the most easily attainable changes that we can make as we continue to advocate for diverse, inclusive education that also includes neurodiversity in the classroom to speak to the District 75 families who do feel left out. Um, a more inclusive system that allows to have all services in the district, in the school would be so much more helpful. And I think we can attain this by having smaller class sizes. Um, teachers who have packed classrooms can never fully know each student whether that's academic or cognitive or emotional. And one thing that we do know as psychologists about children is that if they are seen and heard, they do well. That's all children want to do is do well. And we have to create the environment for them to be able to do that. Um, so I think that um, this is the least we can do to start changing uh, the New York City Department of Education um, viewpoint and outlook that the classrooms need to have more connection, equity, inclusivity, and acceptance of neurodiversity. That needs to start with classroom size, 
then looking at assessments, and then looking at supportive services in the school. Thank you. And Chair, I'll turn to you now for any questions for Maggie, Randy, Ellen, or Marissa. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the powerhouse panel, a lot of uh, very important, meaningful testimony. Um, and also just uh, want to definitely just acknowledge and hear um, uh, Ellen McHugh's uh, testimony. And we absolutely do not want and cannot accept any child from D75 or from any child to be negatively impacted because the goal here is to actually improve outcomes for all, for all children. And I think there's almost a universal agreement that's more class size is beneficial in so many ways. I'll tell you as a teacher that taught uh, inclusion classes, ICT classes um, in, in a large high school, um, I asked, for more common planning time to uh, think about it. You're, you're working with a you're working with a co-teacher, and I don't think it's insane to ask, can we have time to sit down after class or before class to you know co-create curriculum together to modify instruction? It's Ellen. To, give me a cool life. I'm, I'm sorry, Ellen. Uh, to create strategies together. And it was almost impossible to do that because of, you know, uh, just overcrowded school, a lot of class size issues, spacing, time constraints, and so forth. I will say that we, that was my motivation to push for a, what's called an SBO, a school building option change, where we modified schedule on Wednesdays, uh, where periods were a bit shorter, but we try to give some time for teachers to have some time, but I was told by my administration that, Mark, it's just, we don't have the space. We don't have, it's, it's, it's a complicated programming issue because of the number of kids. So I would argue that improving outcomes for kids who really absolutely knew, do need more help and support, um, it's all tied here together. Um, and we already heard from the administration that even minus this bill, they're already making decisions centered on space constraints not centered on the needs of kids and what's best for children, but space constraints. And I, I, that's just not acceptable to me in, in a city with a budget that is ballooning now $100 billion in receipt of federal aid, state aid. Um, we need to center this, but make sure we center it in an equitable way that does not hurt any child or any family, because you are correct. My father is a retired D75 teacher. I know this very well how children historically to this day in many ways are excluded and not part of it. But this is actually about centering them actually for the first time and all of our children in a meaningful, equitable way. So I want to thank everyone for their testimony. And, and Randy, thank you and, and Maggie for really bringing it home in terms of making sure that these recovery programs are not just some cookie cutter, you know, just something to, to, to put onto a piece of paper but actually tailored to meet the individual learning needs, the requirements of our children. But as you heard, we are plagued with some serious staffing issues. I am not hearing a contingency plan. I think that uh, Regent Cashin offered some interesting ideas with regards to the payment of student teachers I talked about. Also that there are staff, there are uh, folks within our graduate program who have taken the exams to be a teacher that make them eligible to be a para right now. And we need to kind of tap into every, every possible way to make sure that we're meeting the kids uh, uh, needs of kids in this moment. So thank you for your testimony. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and next we are going to, our next panel is uh, Diane Ravitch, Elsie McCabe Thompson, Lainey Hameson, Jennifer Goddard, and Rashida Brown Harris. We will first hear from Diane Ravitch. Starting time. Thank you very much, Chairman Traeger, members of the committee. Uh, I'm a historian of education. Uh, my first book was A History of the New York City Public Schools, uh, published almost 50 years ago. As a historian, I have studied reform in New York City and in cities across the nation. Reform these days and for many years has meant shaking up the system. Centralize, decentralize, recentralize, reorganize the bureaucracy, put the mayor in control, 
change the decision-making structure, hire consultants, hire data analysts, hire coaches, or outsource the schools to private entrepreneurs. Or reform means more standardized testing, interim assessments, test prep, testing, and more testing. More testing does not produce more learning or better grades. These so-called reforms barely move the needle, if at all. Class size reduction is a far more powerful reform than any of those I have mentioned. When class sizes are reduced, student grades improve, discipline improves, teacher morale improves, children get the attention they need, especially the children with the greatest needs, and teachers have the time they need to do their jobs. Class size reduction is the most powerful reform you can enact. And I agree with you, Chairman Traeger, that putting the needs of children first is more important than uh, looking at the facilities. The facilities can be changed, but the children only have one chance to learn. Thank you. I uh, just wanna say it is an honor, um, huge fan. I, 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 I read as much as you, you, you uh, have, have published and, and produced and I cannot thank you enough uh, your entire career, you're into this moment, you always center children um, and uh, you hold us in government accountable and uh, speak truth to power from the very beginning. But you are probably like you're a mentor um, and you're one of the greatest public school champions of our time. And I just want to thank you so much for, for your service, for being here, uh, for your incredible work and just say I am a huge huge fan of yours and thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. And next we will hear from Elsie McCabe Thompson. Starting time. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I think this issue is so important. I pulled over on the side of the road to make sure that I could uh, speak to it. And I too am a huge fan of Diane Ravitch and Mary Butts. Um, I'm the president of the Mission Society of New York City. Uh, and we take a long view of education, as does Diane. Um, we're a 209-year-old anti-poverty organization focused on bringing about an end to multi-generational poverty through education. Um, we've seen, we've witnessed a number of trends in education, you know, um, authenticity or the need for authenticity, the need to teach to the whole child, personalized learning, usually delivered through a computer algorithm. Um, and the need for high expectations. Yet, um, probably the most important thing we can do is small class sizes, because it's impossible to have high expectations if teachers don't uh, authentically know a child, because we don't, they don't know what the child is capable of. Uh, we can't embrace a whole child if we only know the names of students in half of the classroom. Um, and we can't personalize learning if a child doesn't have the bandwidth, internet, uh, or a device. Uh, and we certainly can't help um, with the reality of trauma that most of our public school kids are enduring uh, as a result of the pandemic. Um, I am a, a mother of two children with IEPs. Um, I am also the mother of a special education UFT teacher. Um, and I probably should have had an IEP if in the early 60s they had IEPs, particularly for black and brown kids. Um, but you can't um, you know, help children with IEPs if you don't know them. And Time expired. Um, so most of the uh, Carter cases, as we all know them as, um, there are the basis for their uh, litigation against uh, the department is based on, you know, well, we can only get a quality education if we um, go to a private school with a small class size. But, you know, I've advocated for class sizes of 12 students uh, for the teacher. Think of how wonderful it would be if teachers had the luxury, the, the ability to actually know all of their students um, and could, you know, personalize homework. Um, or not, because you shouldn't uh, give homework to a student who's living in a, a shelter. So, you know, um, I hope 
I hope this, um, you know, the city sees fit to drastically lower class sizes. And I would say the bar should be set at 12 because then you could actually mainstream kids with uh, most kids with IEPs and teach them alongside their general education peers with um, dual certified teachers. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you. And next we'll hear from Lainey Hameson, followed by Jennifer Goddard, followed by Rashida Brown Harris. Lainey? Starting time. Go ahead. We can hear you now. Okay. I, you know, I feel honored to be here and to follow both Diane and Elsie. I want to thank uh, Chair Traeger for holding these hearings and for advocating so strong for the issue that all of us who've spoken no matter um, most for kids, which is having a small enough class to really be known well by their teachers and to be really be able to receive the support and the feedback that they need. In 2003, the state's highest court said that public schools class sizes were too large in New York City for children to receive their right under the state constitution to a sound basic education. And yet class sizes have gone up since then. And I have charts in my testimony that you can look at. Um, and so it is really incumbent, I think ethically on the part of the city to spend a good chunk of this additional state and federal money to start reducing class size. I also in my testimony have charts showing how the 20 square feet allowed for kids in New York City public schools is much lower than the space requirements in states around the country. And so this would better align what the space is for other children in schools elsewhere. I also want to emphasize the cost savings as well as the cost of smaller classes. And I think Elsie spoke a little bit about um, how kids with special needs will be much better served in inclusion classes. There'll be lower costs for both special education referral costs and for the Carter cases, which are growing um, immensely every year, I think are now more than $300 million a year. I also wanna point out that there are lots of creative ways to, to create more space, including moving some of the thousands of kids in the expanded pre-K and 3K programs into CBOs where they are have thousands of seats empty. And uh, I have the data on that as well. And those CBOs are sometimes rated higher in terms of their quality in pre-K than the public schools. And so I think we have this tremendous opportunity um, in front of us. Um, we have the, the resources, we have the uh, consensus that this is what's needed among both teachers and parents and experts. And it is time to do what we've known for years is really what's needed to improve both the quality of education in our schools and the equity um, that our kids need because of one of the clear uh, results of the research is that while all kids benefit from smaller classes, those who benefit the most are kids with special needs, kids in poverty, and kids of color, and those are the kids who need the help the most. So thank you again for holding these hearings today, and thank you for your strong advocacy on this issue. I think we can do it as a city if we put our mind to it, and the, the, the real problem is that we haven't put our mind to it yet. Thank you, Lainey. And next, we will hear from Jennifer Goddard. Starting time. Hello. Thank you so much. I am absolutely humbled to be even speaking on this panel. Thank you, Councilman um, members and Chair Traeger. Uh, my name is Jennifer Goddard. I am the parent of a fifth grade public school student who has an IEP and is currently in medically necessary instruction under the DOE uh, because he has asthma and an overactive immune system disorder. I'm one of the parents uh, that you spoke about earlier, Councilman uh, Traeger, about who've had to fund out of their own pocket supplemental education because the one hour per day that my son receives is woefully inadequate, to put it mildly. Um, I also want to echo what Mrs. Grant said earlier about the DOE uh, disappearing. Thank you very much to the chief executive of the space management, Mr. Tratko. I appreciate you still being here. You are a minority, uh, and I wish that your colleagues um, would be called to task next time to stay and listen to what parents are saying, because then they will hear where these problems are coming from and why the council members are so tuned into them. Um, 
I think um, my services for my son have yet to resume for his IEP now that he's no longer in a remote learning program because he's out of physically out of a school building. He's not received anything and he suffers from anxiety. So it's uh, it's definitely a problem. Um, and I want to bring that to your attention. Um, thank you also for the lower lowering the class size pr uh, proposition. That is absolutely uh, something that we support at the New York City Coalition for Educating Families Together, which I represent. Um, and, you know, we also want to reiterate our call that the DOE consider a remote option um, because I know it's a little late in the game. Uh, we're almost a month and a half in, but, you know, we have a lot of problems on the table that would be re readily solved by offering a remote option. Um, you know, the pandemic is still going on. Children ages 5 to 17 are absolutely far and away the highest number of COVID cases, uh, according to, you know, well, every single data chart you want to look at. Um, Despite all this, we don't have a remote Time's option five. like we did last year. So I want to call on you to please consider that. These are problems that we've talked about today between busing shortages, um, overcrowded schools, uh, not being able to offer children, you know, serv related services as part of the, their mandated services, not even talking about the funding that you now have from the federal government. You know, there's a lot more that we could be doing right now and taking a very important tool like a remote learning option off the table has really crippled the DOE. And I think we're seeing the results of it right now. Um, so thank you so much. I, I appreciate the time. And thank you. Thank you. And uh, next we'll hear from Rashida Brown-Harris. Morning time. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Peace and blessings, everyone. Yep, Rashida Brown-Harris here. I'm a parent leader with PAC Parent Action Committee and a proud member of the Healing Center Schools Working Group. Um, I appreciate and respect Council Member Riley, who spoke earlier, and Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson and Kenyatta Reed. Um, we all know what to do. And like Kenyatta Reed said, we do need to ramp it up. Like we, we need to ramp it up. Like it's not implemented citywide across all of our schools. Um, Chairman um, Trigger, you know I'm always gonna come on here and talk about healing-centered schools and restorative practices and how much we need culturally responsive education, more counselors, more enrichment like arts, technology, movement, sports, and project-based learning. But when we talk about healing center schools and we talk about social emotional learning, this DESA SEL screener that's happening is a slippery slope. And I apologize for not being on earlier, so I'm not quite sure what I, I look forward to looking over this whole thing. I don't know what was discussed today about that. When we talk about class size matters, when we talk about capacity, when we talk about being safe in schools and we talk about a SEL screener, anytime we focus on mental or emotional health, it's a plus. But we're assessing it through one standardized assessment. And I heard y'all talking about the assessments earlier. We were talking about academically. This one assessment is based in a white English speaking able-bodied culture. And it will likely disproportionately harm most of our marginalized students. We know this about standardized tests, right? So now we want to do a standardized SEL screener for our children. Who's, who's proctoring these um, assessments? Um, and our, our children with disabilities, or if English is not their primary language, y'all, this is not gonna work for our children. The efficacy and the impact of the screener is an issue. Like the teachers and parents don't even understand it. Parents don't even know what's happening. I heard that parents are opting out and not I'm allowing inspired. their children to be assessed. How would parents opting out and not letting their children be assessed when there's other parents who don't even know anything about it? This is an issue, y'all. What are we doing with this data? How is it culturally responsive? How is it differentiated among age groups? And we already spoke to older high school children who've been assessed and they expressed being very uncomfortable. Councilman Schreger, I beg you to look further into this and to assist us with understanding what we're really doing with these SEL screeners. Thank you. No, I, I fully agree with you. And I go back to something I've said, not just at this hearing, but in previous hearings and throughout my record here in the city council that uh, it, is, it is not enough for us to say that we want to just get, uh, let's say, one social worker per school. Research shows you actually need about one social worker for every 100, 150 students or so. And we still have schools where there are thousands of kids sharing one social worker. Um, and so we are still in my, and I think 
uh, Dr. Harris, uh, you would agree, we're, we're still failing to meet the social emotional needs of kids. And kids don't need exams. They don't need tests. We don't need to, we don't need to regurgitate what we already know. We need support structures built in into schools and after school to support kids, their parents and families. And that's a part of a healing center schools, 100%. But I really believe that we need to really think bigger and bolder about the community school approach from uh, early childhood to K to 12 to adult education, because it's really, really critical that we meet the needs of the whole community, of, of the whole child. And so thank you for recentering that work. But I fully agree with you. And I, again, I commend you for your consistent and persistent leadership. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. And next we will hear from Kem Irby, Carlos, Barbara Scott, Curtis Young, and Davida Lasavio. We will start with Kem Irby. Starting time. Uh, yeah. Yes, good afternoon. Um, I appreciate the opportunity um, to speak to the panel. I am a former parent of New York City um, school, and I had six children in New York City public schools. Um, freight, just in every type of school, I had two children with IEPs, and one of my children was served very well at PS 133 with a great inclusion class. One thing I do know that it's not enough to mandate anything. Everything must come with the proper funding that's mandated. I support lowering class size. I support the effort of my good friend, Lainey Hainson has put forth, of course. But we also understand that New York City schools have been co-located. I don't know where we're going to get the class sizes, where we're going to get the classrooms. And, you know, Tom is going to be tasked with a great feat at doing that. And you have to remember that charter schools are separate schools. Okay. And that is another dynamic that you have to keep on the table of what you're dealing with, with lowering class size. If you're going to give priority to New York City public school children, then charter schools are gonna have to go somewhere. And then there's gonna be another bill because they have some level of leverage at having to be uh, provided space as well. So I just want us to think about that, that it's not a one prong approach to solving this for our children. Importantly, teachers, highly qualified teachers also need to be in the classroom. It's not enough just the lower class size. We also need highly qualified teachers to, to sustain what you want to have happen in the classroom. So I ask you to think about putting together, you know, educational think tank around lowering class size. Choose a school that you want to model to do it in. And I think that it's just very important that we include all the voices in order to make this happen. We have the money. If you remove police from schools, the money that you're funding to have police in schools, you'll have some money to lower class size. You'll have some money to hire more social emotional support services for our children, especially black and brown children deserve more than a sound basic education. We, they deserve more. We cannot do this work alone. There must be a shift to how we educate children. And mind you, New York City is a model for the rest of the nation. I now live in another state and whatever is done in New York, they follow right behind you. So I, I know that's a lot of pressure, but I'm, whether it's good or whether it's bad, I'm just letting you know that everyone looks at New York City public schools in comparison and whatever New York City is doing, it becomes a national model. So I just thank you and appreciate this opportunity to speak to you today. And, 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 I, and I thank you uh, for, for your important testimony and, and for that very powerful feedback. And what I would just add is that um, I actually believe that if we, and I agree that you need a holistic approach, there's no one size fits all, but if we actually valued and prioritize the reduction of class size in concert with other things we talked about, uh, you'd actually attract and keep great teachers uh, in our school system because the number of teachers who are burning out, burned out, have left the school system. And you heard it today from the Board of Regents, quite frankly, that we have a crisis in terms of staffing. 
It's because when teachers walk into a school and see an overcrowded school or, or overcrowded, overcrowded class size, and they try to uh, speak to administration about ways to kind of, you know, better meet the needs of their kids, but not to have 40 kids in a class. And they feel that no one cares about that and no one values that conversation. That's when we lose people. And, and so I think that this is really in concert with so many other types of supports that, that our, our schools need. And I really, again, I appreciate your very helpful and important testimony today. Yes. And one, one thing I want to add, because I'm a school board member in another state, the reason why, you know, the teacher part is a crisis. We don't have enough teachers and enough kids, enough young adults that are going into the teaching profession. So the teachers that are coming and the people that are coming into education are lateral entry people. So that's a whole nother dynamic that we have to solve. And that's why I said, we can't solve it, you know, just by one prong approach, but our children deserve to be in front of a quality educator as well, or else lowering class size will not matter. Great, thank you. Thank you for your testimony, appreciate it. I was talking and was muted. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from, uh, from Carlos. Starting time. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm share members and every concerned citizen. Um, first off, I would like to start off the democracy in education and how the DLE withholding education um, information from us, how that kind of affected the way we make decisions, like Tanisha said, informed decisions to keep our children safe. This information, if it directly affects our children, it, it, it goes to us. It should not be withheld, not for the agency's sake or not for any sake, especially if it concerns our kids' safety, especially at these time, unique times in hi human history. Um, secondly, I wanna express extreme concern towards our most, how would you say, uh, need, need demographic that needs the most, which is the poor students and SDH. As an SDH step parent of a child who's SDH and double up in housing, um, it, it was set a number 12,000 in the homeless system it's not just the homeless system. The people in the homeless system plus everybody out there, the DOE is persistently trying to redefine the definition of homelessness. So it mo it's more conveniently. They get a certain budget from the federal government and the less people are homeless, the less they have to use for them. Now, um, as a parent who asked the DOE, um, my child school for help, I was never referred despite being classified as doubled up and STH student, referred to an STH counselor. As a matter of fact, during, because of my disability, uh, central nervous system, autoimmune disorder, and leaves me susceptible to the disease, and I take um, methoprednisone, which lowers my immune system, so I can't take the vaccine, and I'm homebound. So I can't take my child to school, so I ask for help with busing or anything. Um, they said that they cannot do that in right now. They cannot um, help us. Um, they called ACS to help us. Now, I explained to ACS the same thing. Time expired. Yes. No, please Sir, go ahead and continue. You can finish, your, you can finish your testimony. All right, I explained to ACS the, the very same thing, that it, my child's mother who works for me for Freedom Care, because my central nervous system disorder doesn't have a treatment yet, and I'm currently seen by NYP doctors from well Columbia, and they warn me, about the neuro invasiveness of this viral. Matthew Robbins, my doctor, just wrote a paper, peer review journal about it, and how it, it, it affects your nervous system and your brain through your olfactory. And it just got published. And um, basically, they want her to homeschool my child and, and, my, uh, and our household to lose its only income. Now, I get only $800 from SSD a month. That's what they expect us to live on if she teaches my child because I still have to go to the doctors. I haven't gone to the doctors for months. I've been getting sicker. I've just gone to two trips in the emergency room this week because of the meningitis and flare-ups. It, it gets dangerous and it starts causing me brain damage. Writing this was difficult for me. So it's become, it's causing me brain damage. So I'm very familiar with neuro um, disorders and I'm scared you know, for my child because of the disease neuro invasiveness. And the vaccines don't stop the infections. They may lessen deaths, but they don't stop spreading. And it, that means it does not induce artificial herd immunity. 
it, so that means that they're depending on us to develop natural herd immunity, which I'm not, because according to the CDC, I have three, three, you know, three times the likeliness I'll, I'll die if I get it. So even with the vaccine, um, I don't know what to do. Let my daughter go to school, as I explained. Let her kill me accidentally. Let her be traumatized for life. You know, as I'm, I'm hearing about those kids who get their parents sick and their parents die. And how you think they're going to live with themselves for the rest of their lives. And, and the information is known. You know, my doctor just published it. I mean, it's going into the nervous system. There is very little we know about central nervous system disorders. So why risk our children with that? If remote learning system is still in place and not being used and can and can encompass the whole city, why not let it, it take a portion off the school system? And, you know, it's, a, it's almost like playing shuffle and you don't have to spend, DOE doesn't have to spend as much. They could, they could take a large portion and still get the credit for the student to be in since so they still get their budget, DOE. Sorry, that's it. Just wanted to tell DOE, maybe they could do that. No, I, I appreciate you, sir. And I am in full support of a remote option for families. And it's, it's unconscionable and pure negligence uh, at this point for them to continue to deny. And also I want to say this, that there are some schools who are, let's just say, uh, coming up with creative ways of doing remote options, but that's not across the board. There's no equity in that. Um, and so this needs to be a standard policy across the entire system. So thank you. For, thank you for your uh, very important testimony. Thank you. Uh, Malcolm, you can call the next witness. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to turn to Barbara Scott. Starting time. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to testify. It's my first time ever testifying. And I'm a little nervous, but thank you for the opportunity. First, I just want to say thank you to Tanisha Grant and PS, PSPNP New York for their support. And I just wanted to say that I think remote options should come back because we really need our students. To, some kids are not the same. They don't learn the same. Like my child has an IEP. She's in District 23. The school is not helping me. They're making me apply for home instruction which I was advised to apply for my husband's conditions because my daughter, thank God, doesn't have any conditions. So we're waiting for a response, but they're still um, marking my child absent. They are still not putting any classwork in her Google Classroom for her to do any type of work. So I'm basically like the teacher for her and they're really not helping. And the communication with the school and the parents is getting worse. Like the major is making the parents and the teachers and the principals in conflict with each other because all the information they have, they don't have no guidance from the DOE. So we are all confused. And I just wanted to say that I want remote learning back. And thank you. Thank you. And next we're going to turn to Curtis Young. Starting time. Hello, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, I come before you to, in support of Intro Bill 2374. Uh, my role as Executive Director of Artistic Noise is working with young people who are involved in the juvenile justice system. And one of the reasons I continue to champion this issue is due to the intersection I see with large classrooms and the school to prison pipeline. Um, in a time where racial injustice and criminal justice reform is, is at the forefront of our mind, we must begin to call out what large classes actually are and injustice to all students, particularly those coming from underserved communities. So as I said previously, we know that class sizes uh, reduce or in, in class size reduction improves test scores for students of color. A class size reduction leads to increased college uh, entrances. Um, it also has a non-cognitive and disciplinary impact that, in, that benefits black males and other students of color. So if we are serious about closing all school to prison pipelines. We absolutely must have class size reductions at the forefront of our policy decisions. Students from already underserved communities arrive to their classrooms with existing challenges, traumas, and a variety of social emotional needs. So we know that class size, as, we, as many have said earlier, is not the panacea for improved outcomes for all students. However, when we couple that with adequate staffing, counselors, behavioral specialists, and smaller classrooms, and trained teachers able to deal with, with, with all students, we can provide individualized support and, um, and support all of our students in need of these challenging times. So thank you for your time and this, this morning on this very important topic. Thank you. And next we're gonna hear from Davida Lasavio. 
Starting time. Uh, Davida, if you are, at, oh, you there me? we go, you're unmuted. Okay, yeah, because I wasn't unmuted before. Um, okay, I am a parent. I am also a parent to, it's, I'm a parent to a special needs child. Um, she has an IEP. She is a teenager. She is 16 years old. So she's in high school. We are both high risk per the CDC. The issue, this class size issue I know has been a problem for years because for years she she started off in um, District 75. And first of all, DOE has been failing my child from day one. Um, because she shouldn't have been in District 75. The only thing she accomplished from being in District 75 is not knowing how to do schoolwork and how to get beat up and fight every day because all the boys, because there's mostly boys in there, would fight, would be fighting her, breaking her glasses, ripping her coats, F, X, Y, Z. Um, so they, DOE has actually failed my child from day one um, in protecting her. Now, the issue we have now with COVID like it's been mentioned from various speakers, and there it, the classrooms in the schools are severely overcrowded. They were overcrowded pre-COVID. We are now in the midst of COVID prior to what people might want to say, and the schools are even more overcrowded. Her school, for example, had a, a little over 1,400 kids pre-COVID. Now they have almost 1,600 kids. There is no proper way to completely social distance, let's say, or what have you. The DFS technology air purifiers are not recommended by the CDC. I'm a techie. Those DFS purifiers are trash. They are all, both the lab that, um, that stated that they were better than HEPA. It's owned by the same person that the company itself, Intellipure, is owned by, which is Vincent Lobdell. That's not appropriate. EPA has not certified these. Those schools are dangerous. They're basically petri dishes breeding COVID-19. Time expired. With, 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 please, if I could have more time to speak, please. Um, me and my child are both high risk. Sending my child in could mean death for either one of us. And it's not even about vaccinations because we all know that vaccinate, this is per CDC, Dr. Walensky, that the vaccines do not stop transmission due to the Delta variant any longer. So it's not even about vaccination. It's about that we need a remote option, a centralized remote option. How am I going to send my child to school now when, it's, when the numbers are so much worse? when my child and me haven't even gotten COVID yet because we've been so careful through this entire pandemic so far. The fact that centralized remote options not being given is a problem. The fact that my daughter was receiving help from the teachers and everything at first, and now it seems like ever since um, the last week or two, it's like all, or even her parents not allowed to give me any notes anymore or help her with, her with any questions she had. So basically they're leaving my child to fail because, oh, she has to be in person even though it's detrimental to her health and either she can die or she can bring it back to me and I can die. And we are not, our lives are not expendable. We are no one's human sacrifices and the DOE needs to give a re centralized remote option. To be honest with you, as a techie, I'm gonna say the DOE should have been had some kind of a hybrid remote option, like remote slash in-person hybrid schedule even well before the pandemic due to the fact that we do live in a high tech world. The reason why most of our technology comes from uh, other countries like China and Japan is because Jap Jap Japanese and Chinese children are taught technology from a young age. Our children are behind, and this is the fault of the DOE. So the DOE needs to give a centralized remote option. It is really a mandatory thing. And as for their, the issues about the social and the um, mental, it's more, I'm wondering if they, and I'm saying this from something that I read a doctor that said, are they maybe not realizing that the social and the mental issues are because the children are going through a pandemic. It has nothing to do with in person because I'm sorry, but everybody goes on FaceTime or on um, Instagram video calling. Everybody uses video calling. You're, that's still being social. 
you're just not next to the person to like pinch them or whatever, but just still being social. Just like right now, we're doing this virtually, we're still being social. So that all that social stuff, that's that's garbage. That's just a ploy to do what they want, that, you know, do what their agenda is. And it's not benefiting our kids because my child, this past year, having the centralized remote option, she did better this year than she's ever done, excuse me, ever done in all of her 10 years, now we're, she's in 11th grade, but before that, in her 10 years of schooling, and that most of that obviously being in-person learning. This is the first summer, this past summer, that she did not have to do summer school. So they need to stop this because this is, I remember there being an adage here in New York City about no children left behind. They're leaving all these children behind. And now I have an ACS case when my daughter's school knew exactly from day one why she wasn't in the classroom because she, we, me and her are very, both very high risk. Nah, that, this, is, this is a problem. Like, a, and it's a severe problem. And it's a legal problem too. You know, and this, this, ha, this something has to be rectified, point blank, period. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your very... Yes, Malcolm. Is there, uh, I was just going to say, no, that was, I just wanted to make sure people have been coming in and out of the Zoom. I took a look at the room. I think everyone has testified, but if there is anyone that we have not called on to testify, if you could just use the raise hand function in Zoom. And not seeing any, that concludes all testimony, Chair, so I'll turn it back to you to close out the hearing. Uh, thank you, Malcolm. I also want to just uh, make a slight correction in my, in my opening. I mentioned uh, uh, thanking uh, our, our committee staff. We're, we have wonderful staff. I have, uh, I, I noted Kalima Johnson. I should have, this is an old, uh, she's, she's, va she's valued and we wish Kalima extremely well. I want to thank, give a big thanks to Aaliyah Reynolds. Uh, so my, my apologies for that. Um, also want to just uh, update folks that, um, you know, I introduced uh, a, a package of bills, transparency bills about that would give us data on attendance enrollment uh, per school. And I know City Hall is saying that they'll announce something later this month. Um, we are looking to try to push this, uh, you know, to get this voted on as soon as possible. And it will actually give us a per school look, not just an overall citywide number, but we want to look at it, you know, through zip codes, through school communities to really target that type of support. So uh, stay tuned on that because we're not giving up. We're pushing for greater transparency. Uh, we're hoping to get that out as soon as possible. I want to thank everyone, all the parents, educators, stakeholders that testified uh, here, here today. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, but I think the DOE administration needs to also just do some honest self-reflection because uh, as we've heard over and over again, uh, the needs of kids have not, never been greater but we are facing, in my, in my opinion, a, a severe staffing issue. Uh, you need staff to help do this work. Um, I also believe that when folks work together and believe in big things, big things do happen. And the city has showed that before historically. So uh, we're not giving up on the fight uh, to reduce class size, but in concert with so many other things that we talked about here today. So with that, again, Malcolm, thank you all. I thank the committee staff and everyone testified today. Uh, this hearing is, is a joke.